check one two three check mic hello 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 check check test hello hello check one two three check test hello hello Check hello. Check hello. Hello. Check hello. Hello. Check. Hello. 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 Hello, 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 hello.
Hello, check. Check this. Hello. Hello, check. Hello. Hello, check. One, two, three, check. Hello. Hello. Hello, check. Check this. Hello. Hello, check. Check one, two, three, check mic. This. Hello. Hello. Hello, check. Check this. Hello. Hello. Hello, check sound. Check this. This. Hello. Hello.
सुन के ना पहले हेलो 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 मिस्टर आनंद विल बी हैविंग अ फाइनल ऑडियो एंड वीडियो टेस्ट मिस्टर आनंद फ्रॉम बीएमटीसी बैंगलोर मिस्टर आनंद फ्रॉम बीएमटीसी
हेलो या यू आर ऑडिबल हेलो जी बोलिए वीसी का वीडियो वीडियो हेलो सीएम ऑफिस जी आज सर आवर ऑडियो वीडियो इज क्लियर दिया हेलो नाउ इज ओके हाँ अभी आवाज आ रहा है यहाँ का अभी जो जो बैकग्राउंड में जो ये जो वीडियो प्ले हो रहा है उसका भी आवाज नहीं आ रहा है उसमें आवाज ब्रेक हो रही है प्रॉपरली आवाज पूरी क्लियर नहीं आ रही है ये एक दिक्कत है आपको हमारा हमारी ओर से ऑडियो और वीडियो दोनों क्लियर है हाँ जी सर आपको सामने वो भाई देखा दिखाई दे रहा है अभी हाँ हाँ ठीक है थोड़ा सा जूम इन कर देंगे हाँ थोड़ा सा जूम इन कर दें ठीक है ठीक है वो तो हम एडजस्ट कर लेंगे अभी मतलब कोई वीडियो में लैकिंग है कुछ आ रहा है ऐसा कुछ नहीं नहीं अभी नहीं अभी नहीं इसको के परफेक्टली फाइन तो अभी जो आप ये जो वीडियो प्ले हो रहा है वो कहाँ से हो रहा है ये यहीं से हमारे कंसोल से ही हो रहा है तो उसमें एक दिक्कत है ये जो प्रॉपर आओ उसका ऑडियो नहीं आ रहा है अच्छा ठीक है एक बार मैं क्रॉस चेक कर लेता हूँ ठीक है सर बाकी जो मैं बोल रहा हूँ उसमें कुछ लैग नॉट एट ऑल नहीं अभी तो लाउड एंड क्लियर है अभी okay. जो आ, हमारा बंदा ने आपको फोन किया था अनिल को उसका नंबर आप सेव करके रखिएगा अगर कुछ होता है तो हम हम डायरेक्ट उसी नंबर से फोन करेंगे आपको ठीक है ठीक है सर ठीक है सर ओके ठीक है ओके हेलो वैशाली आ गई क्या अभी नहीं दिख रही
Yes, Professor, received and implemented your thoughts. Wow, the welding quality is very good than before. Thank you, Professor. I have updated my knowledge base. Center of Excellence in Advanced Manufacturing Technology at IIT Kharagpur is aiming to do industrial research. It is visioning as a manufacturing platform in transforming the academic research into industrial practice. This has been set up early 2018 with the support from Department of Heavy Industry under the Ministry of Heavy Industries and Public Enterprises and forming a consortium of top industries in our country, which will have Tata Consultancy Service, Tata Motors, Tata Sons, Tata Steel, HEC Rachi, and DHEM. Researchers at Center of Excellence in Advanced Manufacturing Technology are working in four thematic areas, such as specialty material, design and automation, additive manufacturing, and industry 4.0. Research projects are getting carried out in this newly developed center of uh, excellence, which is a 40,000 square feet, uh, you know, the area. We are giving training to the MSME sectors on advanced manufacturing concept, such as computerized numerical control. We are also planning to give training on the most wanted topic, which is the industrial robotics. This center of excellence is open to all industry sectors, starting from the big, to the very small and also to the startup. So the startups can come forward, they can use our facility to, to nurture their concept and build up the early prototypes for their, you know, the product. The developed system employs cloud infrastructure for managing the sensory data, deriving real-time insights about the welding process and subsequently controls the FSW machine by sending optimized parameters. This has been achieved by employing various signal processing and machine learning techniques. So this has been a very cost saving solution as it eliminates the material rejection and there is no need for performing the quality test as well. I am quite excited that the developed solution is now filed as a patent with Tata Consultancy Services. In a very short span, the Center of Excellence in Advanced Manufacturing Technology has developed a very low-cost artificial intelligence-based Industry 4.0 solution for real-time dimension check of the product. This solution will immensely help the MSME sector. This innovation is about a low-cost Industry 4.0 solution developed for the MSMEs. It is a customized software embedded with computer vision, AI, and ML algorithm that takes cap pictures of a product and measures the dimensional pictures in real time. It also checks the surface quality as well. Here, we used for the image capturing a very low cost webcam um, as the software intelligently enhances the image quality in real time, which eliminates the cost of an expensive camera. Yeah. We have tested a variety of industrial products such as those used in transmission lines, automobiles and mechanical tools. We have obtained accuracy close to 99% within just 10 seconds. We are also lucky to have uh, Tata Sons as our uh, industry partner. Uh, what we basically want to do in this particular project uh, with the help of IOTs and also the traditional manufacturing uh, systems and uh, you know the logistics systems and with the application of uh, digital technologies 
uh, we are trying to improve upon the efficiencies so that the products become more competitive the steps are also optimized and moreover a very good optimization can be built सभागार में उपस्थित सभी अतिथियों को मेरा नमस्कार आप सब से अनुरोध है कि कृपया अपना स्थान ग्रहण कर लें हम कुछ ही समय में कार्यक्रम की शुरुआत करने जा रहे हैं where we can tell in what mode the uh, machine is running and when it is about to fail this helps tata metallics a lot they have estimated that in indirect cost they can save up to uh, 1 crore rupees due to the uh, increase in productivity in uh, in in the direct cost they can reduce the downtime by 40 hours man hours by uh, around uh, 400 hours and 8 lakhs in the wastage cost if such software is available for our msb it is very very you know simple to implement and very cheap that can help them drastically and that is actually the real uh, meaning of atmanirbhar bharat this uh, center is one of its kind in the whole country we can say because the facilities and the infrastructure which has been created it's it's really unique and it will be of great help to all the msmes for quality Uh, manufacturing of uh, products which otherwise they cannot do so the work which we have done in last uh, couple of years uh, is of uh, very interest to be noted here that with the help of tcs we have developed a, a real time monitoring and if so if online on the go if the welding is going on and we can de- de- find out the defect and control i think there is nothing like that and hence so, the software uh, has been developed in consultation with tcs the second thing which has been done is low cost real time uh, you can say dimensional control the other third product we have uh, done is through uh, a software which talks of uh, the predictive uh, maintenance and uh, this is mm, this is a unique one which has been uh, which is being used in uh, uh, tata metrics one of the companies and uh, with these three things we are progressing but then we have bigger plans to uh, come up with uh, some of the uh, trainings which are already going on on some of the uh, inter- um, uh, budding um inter apprentices which are available with btech degree or even diploma degree we are trying to train them for um, working in uh, different heavy industries or in advanced industries or also can become entrepreneurs as well as this uh, facility will help the msms and uh, through this uh, we will also like to enhance our capability for robotics and uh, virtual and augmented reality in uh, near future as well so uh, with this i think uh, we are progressing and we are planning to have all sorts of uh, even bigger industries to come and get the um, uh, quality product made and uh, this will go a long way in uh, in serving the uh, all uh, companies including the msms thank you
बार फिर अनुरोध है कि कृपया अपना स्थान ग्रहण कर लीजिए हम कुछ ही समय में कार्यक्रम की शुरुआत करेंगे हमारे मुख्य अतिथि महोदय डॉक्टर महेंद्र नाथ पांडे माननीय मंत्री भारी उद्योग भारत सरकार उनकी प्रतीक्षा करते हुए और आज का यह महा आयोजन जो कि गुजरात के केवड़िया में होने जा रहा है सबके चेहरों पर आज एक मुस्कान है और उस पल का इंतज़ार जब हमारे मुख्य अतिथि महोदय हॉल में आएंगे प्रतीक्षा की ये घड़ियाँ कुछ लंबी ज़रूर हैं लेकिन फल इसका मीठा ही होगा आज़ादी का अमृत महोत्सव और अमृत काल की यह पावन बेला इंडस्ट्री 4.0 पॉइंट ज़ीरो द चैलेंज इज़ अ हेड यह सम्मेलन आज यहाँ गुजरात के केवड़िया में आयोजित होने जा रहा है और हमारे साथ भिन्न भिन्न क्षेत्रों से महानुभावों का यहाँ जमावड़ा है इंडस्ट्री 4.0 एक नया भारत न्यू इंडिया के निर्माण के लिए इस सम्मेलन का यहाँ आज आयोजन होने जा रहा है कुछ ही समय में मुख्य अतिथि महोदय हमारे बीच में यहाँ पधारेंगे आप सब से अनुरोध है कि मुख्य अतिथि के हॉल में प्रवेश करने के साथ साथ तालियों से उनका स्वागत कीजिएगा और आज के इस आयोजन पर कुछ पंक्तियां कहना चाहूंगी नया प्रात है नई बात है नई किरण है ज्योति नई नई उमंगे नई तरंगे नई आस है सांसे नई युग युग के मुरझे सुमनों में फिर से नई मुस्कान भरो उठो धरा के अमर सपूतों पुनः नया निर्माण करो पुनः नया निर्माण करो इंडस्ट्री 4.0 का ये सम्मेलन जो कि एक नए भारत के निर्माण के लिए एक न्यू इंडिया के निर्माण के लिए यहाँ हो रहा है और यह सम्मेलन आधुनिक भारत के हमारे निर्माता माननीय प्रधानमंत्री श्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी के राज्य में और उनके दृष्टिकोण के अंतर्गत इसका आयोजन किया जा रहा है
हमारे बीच में पधार रहे हैं आज के हमारे इस कार्यक्रम के मुख्य अतिथि महोदय डॉक्टर महेंद्रनाथ पांडे जी केंद्रीय मंत्री भारी उद्योग भारत सरकार आप सबसे अनुरोध है कि कृपया तालियों की गड़गड़ाहट के साथ मंत्री महोदय का हॉल में स्वागत करें साथ ही उपस्थित हैं श्री कृष्णपाल गुर्जर माननीय राज्य मंत्री पावर एवं भारी उद्योग भारत सरकार आप सबसे अनुरोध है कृपया अपना स्थान ग्रहण कर लें चारों तरफ हो खुशियों की लहर हर तरफ चलता गुणगान रहे बरसे असीम अनुकंपा ईश्वर की आप सबके होठों पर सदा मुस्कान रहे सभागार में उपस्थित सभी गणमान्य अतिथियों का सहर्ष स्वागत करती हूं एवं हृदय से अभिनंदन करती हूं। सर्वप्रथम आज के इस महा आयोजन इंडस्ट्री 4.0 पॉइंट जीरो द चैलेंजेस अहेड की प्रेरणा देने वाले परम परमेश्वर को प्रणाम एवं उनका वंदन करती हूं। भारत की आजादी का अमृत महोत्सव एवं अमृत काल के इस नवाचार में आज का यह महाआयोजन गुजरात के केवड़िया में किया जा रहा है केवड़िया जो कि प्रसिद्ध है भारत की एकता एवं अखंडता के पर्याय लौह पुरुष सरदार श्री वल्लभ भाई पटेल जी के स्टैचू ऑफ यूनिटी के लिए विश्व का सबसे ऊंचा स्टैचू जिसका निर्माण भारत के माननीय प्रधानमंत्री श्री नरेंद्र दामोदर दास मोदी जी के नए भारत एवं आत्मनिर्भर भारत के दृष्टिकोण के अंतर्गत किया गया और आत्मनिर्भर भारत एवं न्यू इंडिया को दर्शाता हुआ विंध्याचल एवं सतपुड़ा पर्वत एवं नर्मदा तटी नर्मदा नदी के इस सुंदर तट पर बना केवड़िया नगर में आप सब नु विशेष स्वागत छे और आइए इस शुभ घड़ी को और गहन करते हैं मंच पर आमंत्रित करते हैं हमारे गणमान्य अतिथियों को सर्वप्रथम मैं अनुरोध करती हूं हमारे आज के इस कार्यक्रम के मुख्य अतिथि डॉक्टर महेंद्र नाथ पांडे जी केंद्रीय मंत्री भारी उद्योग भारत सरकार से कि वे मंच पर आएं एवं मंच की शोभा बढ़ाते हुए अपना स्थान ग्रहण करें माननीय डॉक्टर महेंद्र नाथ पांडे जी और तालियों में कमी ना आए तालियां बजती रहें मैं अनुरोध करती हूं माननीय राज्य मंत्री भारी उद्योग एवं पावर श्री कृष्णपाल गुर्जर जी से कि वे भी मंच पर आए एवं अपना स्थान ग्रहण करें श्री कृष्णपाल गुर्जर जी साथ ही अनुरोध करती हूं श्री अरुण गोयल जी माननीय सचिव भारी उद्योग भारत सरकार से श्री शशांक प्रिय माननीय विशेष सचिव एवं वित्तीय सलाहकार वाणिज्य एवं उद्योग मंत्रालय भारत सरकार एवं श्री विजय मित्तल जी माननीय संयुक्त सचिव भारी उद्योग मंत्रालय भारत सरकार से कि कृपया मंच पर आकर अपना स्थान ग्रहण करें एवं मंच की शोभा बढ़ाए बहुत धन्यवाद महोदय मुझे यह बताते हुए बहुत हर्ष हो रहा है कि आज के इस महाआयोजन में हमारे साथ गुजरात के माननीय मुख्यमंत्री श्री भूपेंद्र भाई रजनीकांत पटेल जी वीसी के माध्यम से जुड़े हैं और कर्नाटक से और कर्नाटक राज्य से हमारे साथ एक हजार लोगों की आ, संख्या में यहाँ पर आ, लोग जुड़े हैं जहाँ की ईवी बसेस का इनोग्रेशन होना है तो आप सबसे अनुरोध है कि तालियों के साथ गुजरात के माननीय मुख्यमंत्री श्री भूपेंद्र भाई पटेल जी का स्वागत करें सर मैं आपका स्वागत एवं अभिनंदन करती हूँ और अब मैं अनुरोध करती हूँ माननीय संयुक्त सचिव श्री विजय मित्तल जी से 
कि हमारे माननीय अतिथि महोदय डॉक्टर महेंद्र नाथ पांडे जी को पुष्प गुच्छ एवं शॉल देकर उनका स्वागत करें श्री विजय मित्तल जी अतिथि देवो भव भारतीय संस्कृति एवं परंपरा के अनुसार अतिथियों का स्वागत अब मैं अनुरोध करती हूँ श्री विजय मित्तल जी से कि श्री कृष्णपाल गुर्जर जी माननीय राज्य मंत्री पावर एवं भारी उद्योग का भी पुष्प गुच्छ एवं शॉल देकर स्वागत करें धन्यवाद सर अब मैं अनुरोध करती हूँ श्री विजय मित्तल जी से कि हमारे माननीय सचिव श्री अरुण गोयल जी का पुष्प गुच्छ एवं शॉल देकर स्वागत करें मैं अनुरोध करती हूँ श्री विजय मित्तल जी से एक बार फिर कि श्री शशांक प्रिय माननीय विशेष सचिव एवं वित्तीय सलाहकार वाणिज्य एवं उद्योग मंत्रालय भारत सरकार से कि वे उनका भी पुष्प गुच्छ एवं शॉल देकर स्वागत करें और जिन्होंने सबका स्वागत किया उनका स्वागत होना भी जरूरी है तो मैं अनुरोध करूंगी श्री विकास डोगरा निदेशक भारी उद्योग मंत्रालय से कि वे पुष्प गुच्छ एवं शॉल देकर हमारे माननीय संयुक्त सचिव का स्वागत करें कृपया तालियां बजाते रहिए बहुत ही सुंदर स्वागत यहाँ पर पुष्पों की महक से बहुत ही सुंदर स्वागत यहाँ हो रहा है कृपया तालियों में कमी ना आने दें बहुत धन्यवाद और अब मैं निवेदन करती हूँ माननीय श्री विजय मित्तल संयुक्त सचिव भारी उद्योग मंत्रालय भारत सरकार से कि वे इस कार्यक्रम का स्वागत भाषण दें माफ कीजिएगा स्वागत भाषण से पहले आज मंचासीन अतिथियों से मैं अनुरोध करूंगी कि दीप प्रज्वलन के लिए दीप की तरफ आगे बढ़ें भारतीय संस्कृति एवं परंपरा को ध्यान रखते हुए दीप प्रज्वलन मैं अनुरोध करती हूं हमारे मुख्य अतिथि महोदय एवं बाकी मंचासीन अतिथियों से कि कृपया दीप प्रज्वलन के लिए मंच पर दीप की ओर बढ़ें दोस्तों कहते हैं चलना है हमें अंधकार से प्रकाश की ओर चलना है हमें अज्ञान से ज्ञान की ओर पृथ्वी से आकाश की ओर पदार्थ से सूक्ष्म की ओर प्राणी से परमात्मा की ओर और दीप प्रज्वलन से इस महा आयोजन इंडस्ट्री 4.0 पॉइंट जीरो द चैलेंजेस अहेड का शुभारंभ दीप प्रज्वलन हमारी भारतीय संस्कृति का एक बहुत ही सुंदर एवं महत्वपूर्ण हिस्सा इस दीप को जलाकर नमन करते हैं परमपिता परमेश्वर को और शुभारंभ करते हैं आज की इस सुंदर सुबह के साथ सभी के चेहरों पर एक सुंदर मुस्कुराहट और इस वादे के साथ कि इस मुस्कुराहट को बनाए रखेंगे इसे बरकरार रखेंगे और इसी तरह आगे बढ़ते जाएंगे एक बार फिर से जोरदार तालियां और जिस पल का हम सबको इंतजार था जिस पल के लिए हम सब आंखें बिठाए आंखें बिछाए बैठे थे दीप प्रज्वलन के साथ उस पल का आगाज उस पल का आरंभ करेंगे
आप सभी महानुभावों का बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद और अब मैं निवेदन करूंगी हमारे माननीय श्री विजय मित्तल संयुक्त सचिव भारी उद्योग मंत्रालय भारत सरकार से कि वे कार्यक्रम का स्वागत भाषण दें श्री विजय मित्तल जी धन्यवाद वैशाली ऑनरेबल डॉक्टर महेंद्र नाथ पांडे यूनियन मिनिस्टर हैवी इंडस्ट्रीज गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया ऑनरेबल चीफ मिनिस्टर स्टेट ऑफ गुजरात अवेलेबल विद अस ऑनलाइन ऑनरेबल मिनिस्टर ऑफ स्टेट हैवी इंडस्ट्रीज एंड पावर रिस्पेक्टेड सेक्रेटरी हैवी इंडस्ट्रीज रिस्पेक्टेड एस एस एंड एफ एवी इंडस्ट्रीज एमिनेंट पैनलिस्ट डिस्टिंग्विश ऑडियंस एंड माई डियर कुलीग्स ऑफ एम एच आई स्वागत भाषण फॉर्मल तरीके से शुरू करने से पहले मैं चाहता हूँ कि आप सब लोग हमारे माननीय मंत्री जी का स्वागत एक बार फिर जोरदार तालियों से करें इसलिए कि अपनी अस्वस्थता के बावजूद उन्होंने अदम्य साहस का परिचय देते हुए इस कार्यक्रम में फिजिकल रूप से शामिल होकर इसकी शोभा बढ़ाई है सर हम आपके पूरी तरह स्वस्थ होने की जल्द से जल्द स्वस्थ होने की कामना करते हैं सर इट गिव्स मी इमेंस प्लेजर टू वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस नेशनल कॉन्फ्रेंस ऑन इंडस्ट्री 4.0 पॉइंट टू विच इज टूडे द मोस्ट रेलिवेंट इशू फॉर ट्रांसफॉर्म इकोनॉमीज जॉब्स एंड सोसाइटीज इन अनइमेजिनेबल वेज वी आर ऑल अवेयर दैट आर ग्लोबली कॉम्पिटेटिव मैन्युफैक्चरिंग सेक्टर इज की टू द ग्रोथ ऑफ economy as it provides significant multiplier effect on both output and employment capital goods sector for any nation is the backbone of the manufacturing sector as it produces machines that makes machines on which industrial production is done to make india's manufacturing sector globally competitive the mhi scheme for enhancement of competitiveness in capital goods sector phase 1 was launched as early as in the year 2014 with a total outlay of rupees 930 crore the capital good scheme fostered fostered industrial academia partnership for development of advanced manufacturing technologies under the scheme eight advanced center of excellence were set up at iits iisc cmtis and other premier institutes in partnership with the industry for development of strategic technologies and machinery for industry 4.0 centers at c4 i4 pune iit delhi isc bangalore and cmti bangalore were set up for imparting awareness and support to industry for smart manufacturing capabilities linked to industry 4.0 actually it was mhi who emphasized the importance of industry 4.0 when subject was known to a very few in the country itself today our four summer centers are acting as torch bearers and are actively hand holding industry in their journey to become smart and adopting 4.0 tools and measures on the road to atmanirbhar bharat industry 4.0 is now acting as a key driver keeping that in mind mhi is set to create an ecosystem through the mhi cig phase 2 a scheme which has been launched in january 2022 with an outlay of 1207 crore this is scheme on one hand focuses on technology development in the field such as robotics drones additive manufacturing automotive technologies like intelligent vehicle technology sensor electronics controls and safety component system and on the other hand expand the impact of existing mhi samarth centers ministry of heavy industries under the leadership of our honorable minister believes that for any revolution an important role is to be played by all the stakeholders this conference is one such initiative by taken by mhi this conference today has been organized with an aim to bring all stakeholders on one platform so as to sensitize the industry about the importance and relevance of 
Industry 4.0 and also showcase the success stories and lessons learned during the journey of setting up Samarth Udyog centers so that the way forward could be carved out. The hard and praiseworthy work that the summer centers have done can be witnessed at the stalls they have set up today, which shall be inaugurated by Honorable Minister Sir later in the day. We at MHI feel very delighted to see almost 300 bright minds sitting here and participating in this event, apart from people connected online throughout the country. Amongst the audience today, we have experts and eminent panelists, uh, personalities from IITs, IASCs, research institutes, and skill council. And last but not the least, the most important stakeholders as industry partners. I once again, on behalf of Honorable Minister Sir and on behalf of MHI, welcome all of you to this conference. Thank you, Jai Hind. बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद सर इस स्वागत भाषण के लिए और अब मैं अनुरोध करती हूं हमारे माननीय राज्य मंत्री पावर एवं भारी उद्योग भारत सरकार से कि वे मंच पर आएं एवं हमें सबको संबोधित करें माननीय श्री कृष्णपाल गुर्जर जी उद्योग 40 के आयोजित इस सम्मेलन में हम सबके बीच उपस्थित आदरणीय भारी उद्योग मंत्री श्री महेंद्र पांडे जी गुजरात के लोकप्रिय मुख्यमंत्री श्री भूपेंद्र पटेल जी हमारे विभाग के सचिव श्री अरुण गोयल जी विशेष सचिव श्री शशांक प्रिय जी संयुक्त सचिव श्री विजय मित्तल जी उद्योग जगत से आए हुए श्री दिलीप सुहाने जी श्री समीर प्रकाश जी श्री मृदुल शर्मा जी श्री संदीप गोयल जी श्री रविंद्र उगीकर जी श्री कवन मुख्तियार जी श्री विनोद अग्रवाल जी प्रख्यात पैनलिस्ट विशिष्ट दर्शक पत्रकार और छायाकार मित्रों सबसे पहले मैं आप सभी का इस सम्मेलन में उपस्थित होने पर विभाग की तरफ से आपका हार्दिक स्वागत करता हूं अभिनंदन करता हूं प्रधानमंत्री मोदी जी ने मेक इन इंडिया और आत्मनिर्भर भारत के दृष्टिकोण के मार्ग पर आगे बढ़ने के लिए उद्योग 4.0 अत्यंत महत्वपूर्ण विषय है यह औद्योगिक इंटरनेट ऑफ थिंग्स और साइबर भौतिक प्रणालियों से युक्त डिजिटल औद्योगिक प्रौद्योगिकी के उदय की ओर संकेत करता है जिसमें ऐसी स्मार्ट स्वायत्त प्रणालियां शामिल हैं जो मशीनरी रोबोट और वाहनों जैसी भौतिक चीजों की निगरानी और नियंत्रण के लिए कंप्यूटर आधारित एलिगोरिज्म का उपयोग करती हैं आज दुनिया एक नई औद्योगिक क्रांति से गुजर रही है उद्योग फोर जीरो वर्तमान में डेटा और इंटरनेट ऑफ थिंग्स का उपयोग कर विनिर्माण तथा अन्य औद्योगिक शैलियों को पुनर्भाषित कर सकता है उद्योग फोर जीरो और विनिर्माण एक बार फिर से विकसित हो रहे हैं जिनमें दक्षता बढ़ रही है और उत्पादकता एक नए स्तर पर पहुंच रही है न्यूनतम सरकार अधिकतम शासन के सिद्धांत का पालन करना सरकार और जनता व्यवस्था और सुविधाएं समस्याएं और समाधान के बीच अंतर समाप्त करना कठिनाइयों को दूर करना और आम जनता की सुविधा बढ़ाना समय की मांग है और इसलिए उद्योग 4.0 जीरो तथा डिजीकरण डिजिटीकरण आम नागरिकों और उनके सशक्तिकरण के लिए सुविधाएं सुनिश्चित करने का एक बड़ा साधन है आज पांच जी टेक्नोलॉजी पूरी दुनिया में के जीवन में के हर पहलू में बड़ा बदलाव ला रही है 
भारत भी इसके लिए कमर कस चुका है ऐसे में जब वह विश्व उद्योग चार जीरो की बात कर रहा है तो भारत भी इसका बड़ा भागीदार है भारत एक डेटा पावर हाउस के रूप में अपनी जिम्मेदारी से भी अवगत है और डेटा संरक्षण की दिशा में लगातार कार्य कर रहा है उद्योग फोर जीरो नई प्रौद्योगिकियों और विशेष रूप से उत्पादन प्रक्रियाओं तथा बाजार प्रक्रियाओं के डिजिटीकरण और कंप्यूटीकरण से चालित है लेकिन अब भी प्रतिस्पर्धी अनुकूल परिस्थिति बनाने की आवश्यकता ही मौजूद परिवर्धन की आधारशिला है आज यह अनुकूल परिस्थिति मुख्य रूप से व्यवसाय के प्रत्याशित लचीलेपन से उत्पन्न हुई है उद्योग फोर जीरो सिर्फ प्रौद्योगिकी चालित परिवर्तन नहीं है अपितु यह समावेशी मानव केंद्रित भविष्य सृजित करने हेतु समय केंद्र प्रौद्योगिकियों का उपयोग करने के लिए अग्रणीय नीतियां निर्माताओं और सभी आय समूहों तथा राष्ट्र के लोगों सहित सभी की मदद करने का अवसर है वास्तविक अवसर यह है कि हम प्रौद्योगिकी से इतर देखते हुए उन तरीकों को खोजें जिनसे हम अधिकाधिक लोगों अपने परिवारों संगठनों और समुदायों को सकारात्मक रूप से प्रभावित करने का सामर्थ्य हासिल कर सकें नीति अपनाने संबंधी बाधाओं के अतिरिक्त कुशल जनशक्ति की कमी या या फिर स्वचालित मशीनों और संगत प्रौद्योगिकियों की वजह से रोजगार खोने का डर भी एक बड़ी बाधा है इसका समाधान निकालने की एक व्यवहारिक योजना यह है कि इन क्षेत्रों में जनशक्ति का कौशल बढ़ाया जाए और नए प्रकार के रोजगार सर्जित किए जाएं। उद्योग फोर के लिए मैकेट्रॉनिक्स डिजिटल मेडिसिन प्रिसीजन कृषि रोबोट डिजाइन स्मार्ट ग्रिड डिजाइन और साथ ही प्रबंधन जैसे क्षेत्रों में नए कौशल की आवश्यकता है इन कौशलों को रातों रात सर्जित नहीं किया जा सकता बल्कि इसके लिए शिक्षा और व्यावसायिक प्रशिक्षण में परिवर्तन की आवश्यकता है विनिर्माण भारत के लिए न केवल आर्थिक विकास को बढ़ावा देने के लिए बल्कि रोजगार सर्जन और नवाचार को बढ़ावा देने के लिहाज से सबसे बड़े अवसरों में से एक है भारत सरकार ने 2025 तक सकल घरेलू उत्पाद के विनिर्माण उत्पादन का योगदान को मौजूदा सोलह फीसदी से बढ़ाकर पच्चीस फीसदी करने का महत्वाकांक्षी लक्ष्य रखा है इस उद्देश्य को प्राप्त करने के लिए मेक इन इंडिया को उद्योग फोर जीरो के सिद्धांतों के साथ एकीकृत किया जाना चाहिए और स्मार्ट विनिर्माण का मार्ग प्रस्त करना चाहिए विश्व के सबसे बड़े लोकतंत्र और सर्वाधिक वैज्ञानिकों तथा इंजीनियरों वाले देश के रूप में भारत एक ऐसा प्रमुख राजनीतिक सामाजिक और आर्थिक देश है जो चौथी औद्योगिक क्रांति के मार्ग को प्रस्त करेगा उद्योग फोर जीरो की आवश्यकता को समझते हुए और इसकी अवधारणा के बारे में जागरूकता फैलाने के लिए भारी उद्योग मंत्रालय ने कैपिटल गुड्स सेक्टर चरण एक योजना के तहत चार समर्थ उद्योग फोर जीरो केंद्र स्थापित करने की पहल की है सी फोर आई फोर पुणे सी एम टी आई बेंगलुरु आई आई टी दिल्ली और आई आई एस सी बंगलौर में भारत सरकार के समर्थन से उद्योग फोर जीरो केंद्र स्थापित किए गए हैं मैं आज बड़े गर्व के साथ कह सकता हूँ कि ये चार केंद्र मसाल वाहक के रूप में कार्य कर रहे हैं और उद्योगों को स्मार्ट बनाने की यात्रा में सक्रिय रूप से आगे बढ़ा रहे हैं उद्योग फोर जीरो द्वारा लाई जा रही क्रांति बहुत बड़ी है और यह अलकल्पनीय तरीकों के हमारे जीवन को बदल सकती है भारत को स्मार्ट मैन्युफैक्चरिंग उद्योग फोर जीरो की राह पर आगे ले जाने के लिए उद्योग शिक्षा जगत और सरकार मिलकर काम कर रही हैं मुझे विश्वास है कि यह सम्मेलन विभिन्न हितधारकों द्वारा उद्योग फोर जीरो प्रौद्योगिकी के बारे में जागरूकता पैदा करने और उसके अंगीकरण को मैं एक स्वागत योग्य कदम साबित होगा और इस प्रकार भारत विनिर्माण क्षेत्र का प्रमुख केंद्र बन सकेगा धन्यवाद बहुत धन्यवाद महोदय अपने विचार हमारे साथ साझा करने के लिए और आत्मनिर्भर भारत के निर्माण के लिए आपके मार्गदर्शन में हम निरंतर प्रयास करते रहेंगे आगे बढ़ते रहेंगे और अब मैं आमंत्रित करना चाहती हूँ गुजरात के मुख्यमंत्री 
श्री भूपेंद्र भाई रजनीकांत पटेल को कि वे हम सब को यहाँ संबोधित करें हमारे साथ वीसी के माध्यम से जुड़े हैं गुजरात के मुख्यमंत्री श्री भूपेंद्र भाई रजनीकांत पटेल सर आपका स्वागत एवं आपको एकता नगर केवड़िया में भारत सरकार के हेवी इंडस्ट्रीज मंत्रालय द्वारा आयोजित इंडस्ट्रीज 4.0 कॉन्फ्रेंस में ई बसों के फ्लैग ऑफ कार्यक्रम में मेरे साथ वर्चुअल माध्यम से जुड़े हुए कैबिनेट मंत्री डॉक्टर महेंद्र नाथ पांडेन जी राज्य मंत्री श्री कृष्णपाल जी गुर्जर उपस्थित सभी अधिकारीगण गणमान्य अतिथि उद्योग साहसिक मेरे भाई आप सभी को मेरा नमस्कार विश्व के सबसे लोकप्रिय नेता और एक भारत श्रेष्ठ भारत के पुरस्कृत करता माननीय प्रधानमंत्री श्री नरेंद्र भाई मोदी जी की प्रेरणा से निर्माण हुए स्टैच्यू ऑफ यूनिटी परिसर में यह परिषद आयोजित हो रही है इस महत्वपूर्ण कॉन्फ्रेंस में गुजरात और कर्नाटक को नई इलेक्ट्रिक बस सुविधा प्राप्त होने वाली है इस अवसर पर मैं भारत सरकार एवं प्रधानमंत्री श्री का आभार व्यक्त करता हूं और गुजरात तथा कर्नाटक की जनता को बधाई देता हूं। विश्व भर में इंडस्ट्रियल रिवॉल्यूशन 4.0 की जोरों से चर्चा है इस चौथे औद्योगिक क्रांति में हैवी इंडस्ट्रीज और ऑटोमोबाइल सेक्टर की भूमिका पर यहां चर्चा विमर्श होगा मेरा मानना है कि इस विमर्श से भारत के ऑटोमोबाइल क्षेत्र को कई लाभ होंगे देश के मैन्युफैक्चरिंग हब ऑटोमोबाइल हब से जाने जा रहे गुजरात में इस कॉन्फ्रेंस का आयोजन राइट जॉब एट राइट प्लेस है साथियों माननीय प्रधानमंत्री श्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी के नेतृत्व और मार्गदर्शन में देश डिजिटल क्रांति एवं सर्वांगी विकास की राह पर गतिमान है प्रधानमंत्री जी ने कुछ दिनों पहले ही 5G लॉन्च करके भारत में डिजिटल टेक्नोलॉजी को नई गति दी है उसी तरह चौथी औद्योगिक क्रांति के लिए हैवी इंडस्ट्रियल मिनिस्ट्रीज ने देश के बड़े भारी उद्योगों को सुसज्ज बनाया है एकता नगर केवड़िया में आयोजित इस कॉन्फ्रेंस में ऑटो इंडस्ट्री क्षेत्र में इंडस्ट्रीज 4.0 के विषय में पैनल डिस्कशन भी आयोजित हुए हैं इस डिस्कशन से निष्कर्ष से इस सेक्टर को नया बल प्राप्त होगा हैवी इंडस्ट्रीज मिनिस्टर की कैपिटल गुड स्कीम जैसे विभिन्न प्रकल्पों और प्रयासों से भारत भर में चौथा इंडस्ट्रियल रिवोल्यूशन साकार होता दिख रहा है समर्थ जैसे कॉमन फैसिलिटी सेंटर्स भी देश भर में उद्योग के लिए एक विशिष्ट इकोसिस्टम का निर्माण कर रहे हैं इस विषय में भी कुछ ही समय में माननीय प्रधानमंत्री का मार्गदर्शन प्राप्त होगा प्रधानमंत्री श्री नरेंद्र भाई मोदी ने कार्बन फ्रूट प्रिंट कम करने का जो लक्ष्य रखा है उस सिद्धि करने के लिए उसे सिद्ध करने के लिए ऑटोमोबाइल क्षेत्र में इलेक्ट्रिक व्हीकल की उत्पादन और उपयोग को बढ़ावा देना आवश्यक है गुजरात की सार्वजनिक परिवहन सेवा एस निगम की सेवा में आज 28 इलेक्ट्रिक बस जुड़ रही हैं। प्रधानमंत्री जी के क्लीन ग्रीन ट्रांसपोर्टेशन के उद्देश्य को सिद्ध करने के लिए गुजरात ने एक और कदम उठाया है भारत सरकार द्वारा पचास इलेक्ट्रिक बस गुजरात को आवंटित की गई है जिसमें से 22 बस सेवारत है और आज और 28 बस जनता की सेवा में कार्यरत हो रही है माननीय प्रधानमंत्री जी के दिशा दर्शन में गुजरात सरकार प्रदूषण को रोकने के और परंपरागत ऊर्जा स्रोत के भार को कम करने के लिए कुछ संकल्प है इस संकल्प को साकार करने के लिए इलेक्ट्रिक बस जैसे प्रकल्पों द्वारा राज्य सरकार अविरत प्रयास प्रयासरत है गुजरात सरकार की पर्यावरण उन्मुख नीतियों के कारण गुजरात प्रदूषण मुक्त राज्य में अग्रणी राज्य है 
क्लाइमेट चेंज की समस्या से निपटने के लिए देश में सबसे पहले क्लाइमेट चेंज विभाग मान्य नरेंद्र भाई के नेतृत्व में गुजरात ने कार्यरत किया था यह हम सब के लिए गौरव की बात है इस कॉन्फ्रेंस के आयोजन के लिए मिनिस्ट्री ऑफ हैवी इंडस्ट्रीज और उसके साथ जुड़ी सभी आयोजकों को मैं अभिनंदन करता हूं गुजरात और कर्नाटक की जनता को नई इलेक्ट्रिक बस सेवा के लिए फिर एक बार बधाई देता हूं आज से जनता की सेवा में कार्यरत हो रही ये नई बस प्रधानमंत्री जी दिए हुए अमृत काल के संकल्प को ग्रीन क्लीन एनवायरनमेंट के साथ सिद्ध करेगी यह विश्वास के साथ मैं अपनी वाणी को विराम देता हूं भारत माता की जय वंदे मातरम जय जय गर्वी गुजरात बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद माननीय मुख्यमंत्री जी हम कौन थे क्या हो गए और क्या होंगे अभी आओ विचारें आज मिलकर यह समस्याएं सभी भारत आज हम एक ऐसे भारत को देख रहे हैं जो वर्तमान की धरा पर खड़ा होकर अतीत के गौरव को समेटते हुए भविष्य की संभावनाओं पर नजर डाले खड़ा है और जैसा कि माननीय मुख्यमंत्री जी ने अपने भाषण में कहा इंडस्ट्री फोर में भारत की एक महत्वपूर्ण भूमिका है भारत ही है जो इस चौथी औद्योगिक क्रांति का नेतृत्व कर रहा है जिसमें डिजिटाइजेशन इंटरनेट ऑफ थिंग्स आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस इंटरकनेक्टेड नेटवर्क एडिटिव ऑटोमेशन इत्यादि का प्रभाव रहेगा तो और विलंब ना करते हुए आज के इस कार्यक्रम को आगे बढ़ाते हैं और अब मैं आज के इस महाआयोजन के हमारे मुख्य अतिथि परम आदरणीय डॉक्टर महेंद्र पांडे जी केंद्रीय मंत्री भारी उद्योग मंत्रालय भारत सरकार से सविनय निवेदन करती हूं कि वे आज के इस कार्यक्रम का मुख्य भाषण देकर यहां उपस्थित सभा को अपने विचारों से उद्बोधित करें माननीय डॉक्टर महेंद्र नाथ पांडे जी माननीय यशस्वी प्रधानमंत्री श्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी के बुलंद ऊंचे इरादों और सरदार पटेल जी के विश्व स्तरीय ऊंचे व्यक्तित्व की सबसे बड़ा केंद्र आज सबसे बुलंद इरादों और बुलंद प्रतिमा दुनिया की सबसे ऊंची प्रतिमा सरदार वल्लभ भाई पटेल की जिस एकता नगर केवड़िया में स्थापित है और मां नर्मदा की प्रतिच्छाया उनके आंचल में और विश्व में बहुत तेजी से माननीय मोदी जी की प्रेरणा से उभर रहे विश्व के सबसे आकर्षक केंद्र इस एकता नगर केवड़िया में आयोजित इंडस्ट्री 4.0 का यह सम्मेलन जो भारी उद्योग मंत्रालय भारत सरकार की पहल पर है इस मौके पर और ये एक शुभ मौका है जहां हम गुजरात और कर्नाटक के लिए यहां निरंतर माननीय मोदी जी के कार्बन उत्सर्जन के जीरो तक पहुंचाने के बड़े संकल्प के नज़दीक पहुंचने के क्रम में 175 सौ पचहत्तर ई बसें भी यहाँ लॉन्चिंग का ये शुभ मौका है इस मौके पर आज हमारे साथ मंचस्थ उपस्थित हमारे मंत्रिमंडली साथी माननीय राज्य मंत्री श्रीमान कृष्णपाल गुजर जी ऑनलाइन हम सबसे जुड़े हुए और जिनका प्रेरक मार्गदर्शन हमें मिला ऐसे गुजरात के सम्मानित मुख्यमंत्री श्री भूपेंद्र भाई पटेल जी ऑनलाइन जुड़े बेंगलोर से बेंगलोर शासन के सम्मानित गण स्टेज पर हमारे विभाग के सचिव श्री अरुण गोयल जी 
अन्य वरिष्ठ अधिकारी शशांक प्री जी विजय मित्तल जी हमारे विभाग के अन्य अधिकारीगण श्री अमित मेहता जी रेणुका मिश्रा जी सीएमडी एम डी भेल सिंगल जी आज इस एक दिवसीय सम्मेलन में प्रतिभाग कर रहे महत्वपूर्ण उद्योग क्षेत्र की हस्तियां श्री दिलीप साह साहने जी हमारे रॉकटेल ऑटोमेशन के और मृदुल शर्मा जी किरलोस्कर के वाइस प्रेसिडेंट विनोद अग्रवाल जी अध्यक्ष श्याम एरिक वास बजाज ऑटो ज्ञान प्रकाश जी चीफ ऑटोमेशन टाटा स्टील पुरुषोत्तम कौशिक वर्ल्ड इकोनॉमिक फोरम बैंकेट गेरी मेला स्नाइडर इलेक्ट्रिक तथा हमारे सभी यहाँ पधारे इंडिपेंडेंट डायरेक्टर्स अन्य वरिष्ठ अधिकारी तथा यहाँ पर हमारे आदरणीय पत्रकार बंधु छायाकार बंधु इसके साथ साथ उद्योग जगत के अन्य सम्मानित प्रतिनिधिगण और देश भर के कोने कोने में हमें हमारे विभाग तथा अन्य सम्मानित ऑनलाइन जुड़े हुए लोग मैं सभी का हृदय से सम्मान करता हूं और सभी का विभाग की तरफ से बहुत बहुत आदर व्यक्त करता हूं आज के इस मौके पर जैसा हमारे भूपेंद्र भाई जी ने अपने प्रेरक उद्बोधन में भी संकेत किया और हम सब अवगत हैं कि अपने आप में भारी उद्योग मंत्रालय के लिए बड़े सौभाग्य की बात है कि आज बहुत ही प्रेरक शुभेच्छा आदरणीय प्रधानमंत्री विश्व प्रिय नेता श्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी की कुछ ही क्षणों में हम सबको अवगत होंगी और मिलेगी जिस जो हम लोगों के लिए बहुत ही मार्गदर्शक के रूप में काम करेगा आज के इस मौके पर हमारे पूर्व वक्ता माननीय गुर्जर जी ने और माननीय पटेल जी ने इस विषय पर आयोजित सम्मेलन पर प्रकाश डाला उसके लिए अभिनंदन देते हुए आज मैं आप सभी का इस अत्यंत महत्वपूर्ण सम्मेलन में स्वागत करता हूं भारत आज एक वैश्विक विनिर्माण केंद्र के रूप में उभर रहा है इक्कीसवीं शताब्दी में जो टेक्नोलॉजी डेवलपमेंट और जो एडवांसमेंट पर एडवांसमेंट है इन्वेशन का जो समय है इसमें आप सब खुद ही अवगत हैं कि लगभग इसमें हम यह मैन्युफैक्चरिंग फील्ड भारत की जीडीपी में 16 से 17 परसेंट का योगदान करते हैं हम मैन्युफैक्चरिंग के लोग भारत के लगभग तीन परसेंट सर्विस सेक्टर को सपोर्ट देते हैं और इस क्षेत्र में और इस सुदृढ़ तथा सरकार का प्रयत्न है और समावेशी विकास हासिल करना एक मुख्य हमारा विजन है और मुख्य विजन के साथ हम आगे लगातार बढ़ रहे हैं भारत आज एक ऊर्जावान देश है सबसे ऊर्जा युवा आबादी आज हमारी सबसे बड़ी सामर्थ है और दे दुनिया में एक बहुत ही महत्वपूर्ण इन्वेस्टमेंट के डिस्टिनेशन के रूप में भारत उभर रहा है और मोदी सरकार ने लगातार इसमें एक आवाहन के साथ एक मंत्र के साथ जो इसके पहले की सरकारें जब भी आती रहीं वे अपने चुनाव घोषणा पत्र की कुछ अंश पाँच बरस कुछ लोकल वायदे कुछ अपनी जरूरतें इतने तक सरकारें सीमित रखती थी लेकिन मोदी सरकार ने मोदी जी ने जैसे गुजरात को आगे बढ़ाया दुनिया में वैसे भारत को आगे बढ़ाने में मेक इन इंडिया वोकल फॉर लोकल आत्मनिर्भर भारत ये तीन जो प्रेरक बिंदु हैं इस पर लगातार पहले और उन पहलों में आज जब उन्होंने लाल किले से वो आज के साथ साथ और आठ वर्षों में अपने निरंतर पहलों से उन्होंने साबित किया है कि कैसे इस देश को हम दुनिया के विकसित देशों की बराबरी में ले जा सकते हैं और उस बराबरी में अगर लीडर नेता का भाव ही संस्कृत में नेतीति नेता जो आगे ले जा सके अगर वो विजन नहीं देगा 
तो युवा को कैसे आगे बढ़ने का प्रेरणा मिलेगी और उस दृष्टि से मोदी जी ने लाल किले से जो इस बार का अमृत काल का आह्वान किया है कि हम शताब्दी वर्ष मनाते समय दुनिया के विकसित देशों की श्रृंखला में सबसे आगे खड़े रहे और उस विजन पर हमारी सरकार माननीय मोदी जी की प्रेरणा से लगातार काम कर रही है मैं बहुत विस्तार में नहीं जाऊंगा लेकिन सभी लोग समझ रहे हैं कि जिन जिन चीज़ों की परिकल्पना नहीं होगी उस परिकल्पना पर भारत को आगे ले जाने के लगातार आप अग्रणी लोग अधिकारी वर्ग विचारक और हमारा जो पॉलिटिकल सेटअप है माननीय मोदी जी के नियमित मार्गदर्शन में काम कर रहा है तो उस दृष्टि से इंडस्ट्री 4.0 का अपने आप महत्व बढ़ जाता है और महत्व तो बढ़ जाता है और हम कर सकते हैं इसका सबसे बड़ा प्रमाण है कि 2014 में हम इस जो वैश्विक नवाचार था इनोवेशन का ग्लोबल इनोवेशन इंडेक्स में जो भारत 50 देशों के समूह में पहले शामिल नहीं था उसका स्थान इक्यासीवा था 81 प्लेस पर हम थे और आठ वर्षों की निरंतर मोदी सरकार की पहलों देशवासियों की सहभागिता का परिणाम है कि आज हम 2022 में छलांग लगा करके 40वें स्थान पर दुनिया में आज पहुंच चुके हैं जहां हम इक्यासीवा में थे तो हर क्षेत्र में हमारी सरकार इस पर काम कर रही है और ईज ऑफ डूइंग बिजनेस उद्योगों के लिए नियमों का सरलीकरण तमाम अनावश्यक कानूनों को और उनके तमाम कानूनों के बंधनों से उद्योगपतियों को उन झंझटों से मुक्ति दिलाना और इसके साथ साथ डिजिटल पहलों के साथ जैसा अभी गुजर जी ने और जैसा 5G का भी लॉन्चिंग का उल्लेख किया तमाम नई से नई डिजिटल पहलों के साथ जैसे भूपेंद्र भाई जी ने उल्लेख किया मोदी सरकार उद्योगों उद्योगों के लिए एक ट्रांसपेरेंट और इफेक्टिव पॉलिसीज बनाई है जिनके रिजल्ट हमें आज क्रमशः दिख रहे हैं इसके साथ साथ पिछले साल 2021 में आए ग्लोबल मैन्युफैक्चरिंग रिस्क इंडेक्स ये अपने आप में भारतवासियों के लिए बड़ा उत्साहवर्धक है और उस रिस्क इंडेक्स में जो सर्वे आया इस सर्वे में भारत ने मैन्युफैक्चरिंग डिस्टिनेशन के क्षेत्र में विश्व स्तरीय भरोसेमंद स्थान बनाया और अमेरिका को हुई पिछाड़ के दूसरे स्थान पर यद्यपि अभी चीन पहले पर है लेकिन भारत दूसरे स्थान पर पहुंच गया है अमेरिका भी उसके बाद आता है ये भारत की मैन्युफैक्चरिंग जो हमारा आज की चर्चा का विनिर्माण के विषयों को आगे बढ़ाने का एक महत्वपूर्ण कारक है इसमें भारत की स्थिति बनी है और ये सब यह सारी चीज़ें मोदी सरकार की अस्थायी नीतियाँ पारदर्शी प्रक्रिया आज उद्योग जगत को भरोसा है कि मोदी जो कहते हैं वो करते हैं और करते रहेंगे ये भरोसा जो उद्योग जगत को जो मोदी जी ने दिया है इसके कारण आज ये परिस्थितियाँ बनी हैं पिछले दो सालों में विश्व के अंदर कोरोना में काफ़ी कठिनाइयाँ आई लेकिन भारत ने लगातार इसमें अपना कोरोना की कठिनाइयों से उबर करके दुनिया के देशों की तुलना में मानवीय सेवा भारत की भारत के बाहर तमाम विश्व के देशों की वैक्सीनेशन की मानवीय सेवा को प्रदान करने के साथ साथ और उसने अपना स्थान बढ़ाया है आज ग्लोबल सप्लाई चेन में आज तमाम ऐसी की डिस्पी जो असमानता था इसको पाटते हुए एक मैन्युफैक्चरिंग हब के रूप में भारत उभर रहा है इस इंडस्ट्री फोर की आज इस कॉन्फ्रेंस के माध्यम से मुझे पूरी उम्मीद है कि इंडस्ट्री एजुकेशनल इंस्टीट्यूट यूथ इंटरप्रेनोर और पॉलिसी मेकर के बीच में एक नया सामंजस्य होगा वैश्विक प्रतिस्पर्धा के इस दौर में इंडस्ट्री फोर जीरो द्वारा संचालित स्मार्ट मैन्युफैक्चरिंग के फलस्वरूप जो हमारी प्रोडक्टिविटी है इसमें वृद्धि आएगी कम लागत में बेहतर गुणवत्ता और बेहतर संसाधन उपयोग के चलते भारत अग्रणी मैन्युफैक्चरिंग केंद्र के रूप में बनने का मिशन जल्दी ही हासिल कर सकता है इस अपेक्षा से आयोजित इस चर्चा का इस मंथन के अवसर पर आज आर्टिफिशियल इंटेलिजेंस रोबोटिक्स इंटरनेट ऑफ थिंग्स थ्री डी प्रिंटिंग साइबर फिजिकल सिस्टम वर्चुअल रियलिटी डाटा एनालिटिक्स जैसी स्मार्ट डिजिटल प्रौद्योगिकियाँ अब विभिन्न औद्योगिक डोमन 
तथा भौगोलिक क्षेत्रों के सर्वांगीण विकास के लिए प्रकाश स्तंभ सरंगी सरीखी हैं आज की जरूरतें हैं इंडस्ट्री फोर जीरो केवल प्रौद्योगिकी के बारे में नहीं बल्कि विचार और व्यापार के लिए भी लोगों को लो, करने के लिए तरीकों के बारे में भी आज देश के विकास के साथ साथ विभिन्न वैश्विक सूचकांगों में भारत की एक रैंकिंग में जबरदस्त योगदान करेंगे पिछले कुछ वर्षों में भारत ने स्मार्ट मैन्युफैक्चरिंग में अपने को काफ़ी आगे बढ़ाया है इंडस्ट्री 4.0 में आज सल्यूशन में इंडियन इकोनॉमी के विभिन्न क्षेत्रों में एग्जिस्टिंग प्रोसेस को अनूठे रूप में बदल कर रख दिया है अब मैन्युफैक्चरिंग क्षेत्र मेक इन इंडिया पहल के साथ इंडस्ट्री 4.0 के सिद्धांतों को एकाकार कर रहे हैं ताकि वैश्विक प्रतिस्पर्धाओं के बीच विजयी होने के लिए हम आप सब आगे बढ़ सकें पिछले आठ वर्षों में भारत सरकार द्वारा किए गए प्रयासों से डिजिटल टेक्नोलॉजी में क्रांतिकारी सुधार आया जो इस तथ्य से स्पष्ट है कि भारत आज 75 करोड़ से ज़्यादा अधिक स्मार्ट फोन धारक आज भारत के अंदर है 75 करोड़ से ज़्यादा स्मार्ट फोन धारक आज भारत में हैं आज भारत के अंदर 80 करोड़ से ज़्यादा लोग इंटरनेट यूज कर रहे हैं यह हमारे इस सामर्थ्य को प्रदर्शित करता है अभी चर्चा फाइव की हो चुकी उस पर आज स्मार्ट मैन्युफैक्चरिंग में आज लगभग 34 करोड़ से ज़्यादा लोग ई कॉमर्स तथा डिजिटल भुगतान को ऑनलाइन ढंग से कर रहे हैं ये भारत दुनिया का पहला देश है जहाँ 34 करोड़ लोग ऑनलाइन भुगतान कर रहे हैं ये सब इंडस्ट्री 4.0 को अपनाने के लिए आज अपने जो भी कोई माल की बुकिंग है कोई आगे और काम है इन सब में एक तरह की क्रांतिकारी पहले मददगार हैं आर्ग कार्गो संचालन की निगरानी के लिए ट्रैकिंग डिवाइस एस्टेब्लिशमेंट किए गए हैं इंडस्ट्रीज अपने कार्गो की रियल टाइम बेसिस पर ट्रैकिंग कर पाने में सक्षम है आज हम इस परिस्थिति में वरना कितनी इसमें विलंब कहीं गायब हो जाना कहीं कार्गो की कठिनाइयां इन सब चीज़ों से आज उबर रहे हैं इंडस्ट्री फोर की राह पर भविष्य के रोजगार हाई स्किल्ड होंगे न्यू डिजिटल टेक्नोलॉजी के चलते न्यू टाइप ऑफ हाई स्किल जॉब्स सृजित होंगे जो देश की युवाओं के सपनों को पूरा करने के लिए जिन सपनों के लिए देश की युवा दूसरे देशों की तरफ ताकते हैं वो आज भारत में ही उपलब्धता की परिस्थितियां बनेगी इन सब क्षेत्रों में ग्लोबल कैपिटल गुड्स हमारे विभाग के कैपिटल गुड्स के क्षेत्र में टेक्नोलॉजी डेवलपमेंट को प्रमोट करने तथा मैन्युफैक्चरिंग कैपेसिटी तथा हमारे इन और इन विषयों को इन फ्रैक्चर को ये जो अपने मैन्युफैक्चरिंग फील्ड है इन सब को बढ़ाने के लिए कौशल संबंधी जरूरतों को पूरा करने के लिए हम लोगों ने कई पहलें की हैं और इसके साथ साथ हमने आपको जान के खुशी होगी कि हमने कैपिटल गुड्स जब स्कीम लॉन्च की पिछले साल इसके सेकेंड फेज को हमने पहले के बजट से ज़्यादा 1207 करोड़ रुपए, 1207 करोड़ रुपए फाइनेंशियल आउटले रखा और जिसको पुनः लॉन्च किया जिसमें सरकार ने नौ करोड़ रुपए का बजट सपोर्ट दिया सरकार ने नौ करोड़ रुपए का बजट सपोर्ट दिया और धन्यवाद है कि इंडस्ट्री के कोऑपरेशन में भी इसमें 232 करोड़ रुपया मिला जिसके अंतर्गत हम हमारे मंत्रालय द्वारा तमाम ऐसे एक्सीलेंस सेंटर्स स्थापित किए गए हैं जिसमें कॉमन इंजीनियरिंग फैसिलिटेशन सेंटर्स ऐसे तमाम टेक्नोलॉजिकल वाइब्रेंट इकोसिस्टम तैयार किए गए जिसके चलते आज हम स्मार्ट टेक्नोलॉजी के फील्ड में इंडस्ट्री 4.0 से देश की मैन पावर को ट्रेन करने की अपनी पहलों पर आगे बढ़ रहे हैं आज अनेक पहलें भारी उद्योग मंत्रालय द्वारा वेब आधारित की जा रही हैं ओपन मैनुफैक्चरिंग टेक्नोलॉजी इनोवेशन और प्लेटफार्म भी विकसित किया इसके माध्यम से अनेक इंडस्ट्री की टेक्नोलॉजी समस्याओं की और हम उस पर इंडस्ट्रीज को खुद फ्रेंडली उनको जोड़ रहे हैं उनके रिक्वायरमेंट के हिसाब से क्या नया इनोवेशन होना चाहिए वो अपने जरूरतों और अपने अनुभवों को शेयर करते हैं और इसमें तमाम वैज्ञानिक सहभागी होते हैं इसमें हमारी संस्थाएँ सी एम से हमने एक्सीलेंस सेंटर से हम जुड़े हैं इस कैपिटल गुड के बजटरी सपोर्ट के साथ इस सी एम टी आई और आई ये कोयम्बटूर 
ISC Bangalore, IIT Kharagpur, HEC Rachi. These are all in the world, like in textile, machine, machine tools, solar, bedding, in all the manufacturing fields, we are working on all the manufacturing fields. To make any country's vision and the next capital good of this, जो अन्य पड़ाव अन्य विषय जो आज इंडस्ट्री 4.0 के इस चर्चा के हैं उसमें कैपिटल गुड का भी जो हम लोगों ने अब तक पहले की है वो भी आपकी सहभागिता में एक इसमें महत्वपूर्ण कारक है और किसी भी राष्ट्र के विजन को लागू करना सबसे महत्वपूर्ण होता है मोदी जी ने आज वो विजन मैन्युफैक्चरिंग क्षेत्र के लिए तमाम ऐसी पहलें की हैं इसके पहले किसी सरकार ने इस तरह से पहले नहीं की उसका कैसे उद्योग जगत ने रिस्पांस दिया है वो मैं आपसे शेयर करना आज जरूरी समझता हूँ तेरह पीएलआई भारत सरकार ने लॉन्च की और मैं धन्यवाद दूंगा आदरणीय प्रधानमंत्री जी को कि उनमें से हमारे मंत्रालय को भी ऑटो फील्ड से जुड़े हुए एक सबसे बड़े पार्ट के रूप में सपोर्ट दिया और तेरह पीएलआई टेक्सटाइल इलेक्ट्रॉनिक्स भिन्न भिन्न क्षेत्रों में तो जिसमें हमने पी ऑटो का जिम्मा हमारे विभाग को जो दिया इसमें पीएलआई एसीसी बैटरी तथा पीएलआई एल ऑटो लागू की जा रही है आज इसमें भारी उद्योग मंत्रालय ने बढ़ते हुए जो कदम उठाए हैं वह आप सबके लिए देशवासियों के लिए और उद्योग जगत सहभागिता के लिए बड़ा ही उत्साहवर्धक है अट्ठारह करोड़ का बजटी सपोर्ट लेकर के और पचास गीगावाट की हम ए बैटरी इस हिंदुस्तान में बनाए जबकि आज अभी कुछ भी नहीं बन रहा है हिंदुस्तान इस ए बैटरी फील्ड में चाइना की मोनोपोली सर्वाधिक है और चाइना के आगे दुनिया के सारे देश मात्र 10 परसेंट में है पचासी से 90 परसेंट चाइना ही है कुछ जगह थोड़ी से अंश मलेशिया का अन्य देशों की तुलना में ज़्यादा है वहाँ मोदी जी ने कितना बड़ा विजन रखा है कि 50 गीगावाट का कंसेप्ट लेके भारत के लिए 18,100 करोड़ की पीएलआई लॉन्च की गई हम लोगों को उपेक्षा थी कि शायद हमारे विभाग के जिम्मेवार सचिव और गोयल जी और सारी टीम ने उस पर बहुत ठीक से पहल की अपेक्षा थी कि 50 गीगावाट की शायद हमें लेवल पा जाएंगे या ना पा जाएंगे लेकिन आप सबको बताते हुए हमें खुशी हो रही है मैंने पहले भी मीडिया में ये बात कही है लेकिन इस मौके पर दोहराना अपना कर्तव्य समझता हूँ कि हमको उसके अगेंस्ट हम अपेक्षा करते थे 128 गीगावाट का लोगों ने अपना सपोर्ट के साथ आगे कंपनियां आई और मोस्टली भारत की जिसमें हमने जो परीक्षण किया तो एक सौ गीगावाट परफेक्ट आई और हमने बड़ी तेजी से इस प्रक्रिया को आगे बढ़ाया और जब उनसे पर्सनल लेवल पर बैठ के रिव्यू हुआ कि अच्छा ये तो भारत सरकार सपोर्ट दे रही है आप अपनी तरफ से क्या करेंगे जब इस इंडस्ट्री फील्ड में आप उतर रहे हैं उन्होंने जो बात बताई कहा आप तो हमें 50 गीगावाट का सपोर्ट दे रहे हैं हम 75 गीगावाट अपनी क्षमताओं से और प्लस करेंगे इस रास्ते पर उतर गए अब कल्पना करिए हिंदुस्तान जब ये जहां आज एक बैटरी नहीं बन रही है वहाँ लिथेनियम बैटरी जो आज की इक्कीसवीं शताब्दी की ज़रूरत है वो सौ गीगावाट से भी ज़्यादा हिंदुस्तान में बनेगी तो हम आज जहाँ इम्पोर्टर हैं वहाँ इस फील्ड में जरूरतों को पूरा करते हुए एक्सपोर्टर के फील्ड में उतरेंगे ये भारत की क्षमता मोदी जी के विजन से आगे बढ़ रही है इसी तरह से ऑटो फील्ड में तमाम ऐसे एडवांस टेक्नोलॉजी की जो चीज़ें हैं ऑटो फील्ड में गाड़ियाँ चाहे ऑटोमेटिक ये गियर सिस्टम हो और स्टेयरिंग सिस्टम हो उसका इलेक्ट्रॉनिक सिस्टम हो सब हम विदेशों पर निर्भर हैं मोदी जी कहना है हम क्यों देश में नहीं बना सकते उस पर उन्होंने पच्चीस 938 करोड़ का बजटरी सपोर्ट दिया और जिसमें हम लोगों को उम्मीदें थी कि कुछ आ जाएगा कुछ 25 30 करोड़ पचास हज़ार करोड़ तक ही बजटरी सपोर्ट में और उद्योग जगत आएगा आज उद्योग जगत के लोग बड़े भारी मात्रा में इसमें भी प्रतिभाग किए और भारत सरकार के इस योजना पर हम 25,938 करोड़ सपोर्ट दे आगे बढ़े और वो चौहत्तर हज़ार पाँच सौ करोड़ के कमिटमेंट के संग प्राइवेट प्लेयर्स हमारे साथ जुड़े और भारत उस फील्ड में भी आज एक बहुत बड़ा तो कुल मिला के आप समझिए कि तेरह पीएलआई में अगर दोनों चीज़ों को जोड़ दिया जाए तो सवा लाख करोड़ से ज़्यादा केवल 
हमारा भारी उद्योग मंत्रालय जो है इस देश के मैन्युफैक्चरिंग फील्ड में आगे योगदान कर रहा है तो आज किस मौके पर मैं आप सबको बताते हुए यह भी मुझे खुशी हो रही है जिसकी चर्चा ई बसों की हुई हमने फेम वन और फेम टू ये इलेक्ट्रिक मोबिलिटी को बढ़ाने के लिए काम कर रहे हैं और आज इस मौके पर इस बहुत ही पवित्र और बहुत ही महत्वपूर्ण केंद्र एकता नगर से हम एक सौ गुजरात की 100 सौ बेंगलुरु की बसों को लॉन्चिंग कर रहे हैं इस दृष्टि से बताने में हम लोगों ने इसमें जो हमारा ये पहले हम टू व्हीलर पर पर किलो वाट दस हज़ार रुपये सब्सिडी देते थे यंगस्टर ज़्यादा से ज़्यादा इस तरफ बढ़ रहे हैं जहां हमने इसमें जुलाई 2021 अगस्त में बढ़ाया तकरीबन पंद्रह हज़ार रुपये प्रति किलो वाट जबरदस्त उछाल आया आज युवा उस तरफ तेज़ी से बढ़ रहे हैं आज टू व्हीलर थ्री व्हीलर फोर व्हीलर कमर्शियल और बड़ी बसों के लिए हम लोग लगातार इसमें काम कर रहे हैं और इसमें आदरणीय मोदी जी ने पिछले दिनों इस विषय को भी गुजरात की भूमि से उठा के हम लोगों को बड़ा मनोबल बढ़ाया आज हम इस समय हम लोगों ने तीन हजार पाँच सौ अड़तीस ही बसें जो सैंक्शन की वो उन, करीब उन्नीस सौ पचास बसें आज सप्लाई हो चुकी उस सड़कों पर हैं इसके अलावा हम तीन हजार पाँच सौ से अधिक और ही बसों को हमने विभिन्न शहरों के लिए हम लोगों ने स्वीकृति दे दिया है उस पर भी लॉन्च करने जा रहे हैं और उस कुल मिला करके हम इसमें लगभग सात हज़ार से अधिक ई बसें देश के विभिन्न प्राथमिकता उन शहरों की जहां प्रदूषण का रेशियो ज़्यादा है पहले उन्हें फिर धीरे धीरे सारे स्टेप पर बढ़ाते हुए ये सारे क्रम हमारे पी इसमें कई अच्छी पहलें कर रहे हैं हमारे पी एस चार्जिंग और इंफ्रास्ट्रक्चर पर भी काम कर रहा है फास्टिंग फास्ट चार्जिंग के क्षेत्र में हमारा ए आर आई पुणे जल्दी ही अपने समाधान पर पहुंचने वाला है और बहुत ही अच्छा समाधान लेके आने वाला है तो ये काप ट्वेंटी सिक्स का जो पीएम साहब का विजन है उस विजन के साथ लगातार भारी उद्योग मंत्रालय उनकी प्रेरणा से आगे काम कर रहा है और हमारे तमाम मंत्रालय के अधीन जो पी एस भाग ले रहे हैं इन सब ने अनेक लोक कल्याण के कदमों को इंडिपेंडेंट डायरेक्टर्स की सामाजिक सहभागिता को भी माननीय मोदी जी ने प्रेरित किया आज भी यहाँ प्रतिभाग कर रहे हैं मैं उनका वेलकम कर रहा हूँ और आज एक बड़ी संख्या में लोग जगह जगह लाइन जुड़े मैंने पहले उनकी चर्चा किया और इन सब चीज़ों को आगे बढ़ाते हुए आज जिस प्रकार से देश को के विजन को लागू करने में मोदी जी ने अनेक पहलें की हैं उस दृष्टि से मैं आज दो बातें आपसे शेयर करना अपना कर्तव्य समझता हूं और मोदी जी उस संकल्प के एक मेरे पास शिवमंगल सिंह सुमन की कविता जिसे माने अटल जी भी बहुत याद करते थे और मोदी जी भी उसको बहुत सम्मान देते हैं और तमाम लोग मोदी जी के कदमों से उनकी आलोचना उनकी कठिनाइयों में विपक्ष के पास इस देश में कुछ नहीं रहता है तो कोई न कोई ऐसा प्रशंसा करने के लिए जो इसको आगे बढ़ाने वाले इस देश में ऐसे भी परंपरा रही है कि इस देश के अंदर लोग अच्छा करने वालों को और हमारी विचार पर श्रृंखला ने उसमें ऐसे अनेक उदाहरण हैं कि देश के लिए जब अच्छा हुआ देश के लिए जरूरत हुआ तो हम लोग साथ खड़े होते हैं और देश सर्वोपर ले चलते हैं लेकिन उन सबसे बिना विचलित हुए कविता लंबी है लेकिन मैं इतना ही कहूँगा कि मोदी जी संकल्प के हैं कि वरदान मांगूंगा नहीं चाहे हृदय को ताप दो मैं उसका छोटा आंसर पढ़ रहा हूँ चाहे मुझे अभिशाप दो कुछ भी करो कर्तव्य पथ से किंतु भागूंगा नहीं वरदान मांगूंगा नहीं जनता का आशीर्वाद मांगूंगा इस भाव से चलते हुए दो शब्द अपने मन में मैं आज आप सबको इस देश के अंदर जो मोदी जी ने एक नई फिलासफी दी है शासन की प्रशासन की और जनता के जनादेश के सम्मान और सेवा की वो चीज आपको रेखांकित करके अपनी बात पूरी करूंगा एक है प्रधानमंत्री आवास का नाम 
प्रधानमंत्री आवास का नाम पहले सेवन रेस कोर्स हुआ करता था और उन्होंने उसका नाम बदला लोक कल्याण मार्ग संविधान के प्रियम्बल में रहता है कि हम लोक कल्याणकारी शासन के लिए शासन बने इसकी अवधारणा करते हैं और लोक कल्याण को अपने जीवन का महामंत्र मान करके मोदी जी ने एक संदेश दिया देशवासियों को दिल्ली जो भारत की राष्ट्रीय राजधानी है देश को प्रेरणा संदेश देने के अनेक अवसर वहाँ से प्राप्त होते हैं कि ये लोक कल्याण के लिए व्यवस्थाएं हैं न कि भोग और आराम अपने व्यसन के लिए है ये लोक कल्याण के लिए शासन है और लगातार लोक कल्याण के कदम उठते जा रहे हैं और हाल में जो उन्होंने आज इस देश के राजपथ को गवर्न करने वाले जगह को बदल के कर्तव्य पथ शब्द केवल दो हैं कर्तव्य और पथ लेकिन शब्द में अर्थ की व्यापकता इतनी है कि हर नागरिक हर अधिकारी इस भारत के हर निवासी शासन से जुड़े हर अंग इतना व्यापक है हर एक को अपना कर्तव्य करना है हर उद्योगपति हर संबंधित लोग इसके एक एक शब्दों की व्याख्या नहीं कर रहा हर एक को अपना कर्तव्य करना है और जिस कर्तव्य की प्रेरणा लगातार महसूस करें आज उन्होंने एक नई फिलासफी दी है देश को कि व्यक्ति अपने कर्तव्यों को बढ़ता जाए तो निश्चित तौर से अमृतकाल में दो का सैंतालीस का भारत दुनिया का सबसे अग्रणी देश भारत होगा इस अपेक्षाओं के साथ आज इस इंडस्ट्री 4.0 के सम्मेलन में आपके प्रति एक बार बहुत ही आदर व्यक्त करते हुए ऑनलाइन जुड़े श्रीमान मुख्यमंत्री गुजरात पटेल जी के प्रति और बेंगलोर के लोगों के प्रति अन्य ऑनलाइन जोड़ों लोगों के प्रति आदर व्यक्त करते हुए अपनी ये बात पूरी करता हूँ बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद सभी को आदरपूर्वक नमस्कार बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद महोदय ऐसा ओजस्वी एवं उत्साहवर्धक भाषण आपके अनुभवी विचार निश्चित रूप से हमारे लिए बहुत ही प्रेरणादायी हैं और अपने कर्तव्य को पूर्ण करते हुए ऐसा हमारा वादा है कि आत्मनिर्भर भारत और न्यू इंडिया के लिए हमारे प्रयास निरंतर तीव्र होते चले जाएंगे आज हमारे साथ इंडस्ट्री एवं उद्योग क्षेत्र के महानुभाव देश के विभिन्न भागों से एकत्रित हुए हैं मैं विशेष तौर पर स्वागत करना चाहूंगी श्री शैलेश चंद्रा एमडी टाटा मोटर्स का सर आपकी उपस्थिति से इस कार्यक्रम की शोभा और बढ़ गई है आपका हार्दिक अभिनंदन एवं स्वागत करती हूं आज हम एक ऐसे भारत को देख रहे हैं जो अभूतपूर्व बदलावों के मंथन से निकला है और इस मंथन द्वारा निकले अमृत से एक नए भारत के नवनिर्माण की कल्पना हमारे आदरणीय प्रधानमंत्री श्री नरेंद्र दामोदर दास मोदी जी की दूरदर्श दूरदर्शिता एवं नवीन दृष्टिकोण का परिणाम है यह हमारे लिए अत्यंत सौभाग्य एवं हर्ष का विषय है कि माननीय प्रधानमंत्री जी विश्व के सबसे लोकप्रिय नेता भारत के निर्माता एवं भारत को तकनीक एवं नवाचार के क्षेत्र में नई ऊँचाइयों तक ले जाने वाले मोदी जी ने हमारे आज के इस कार्यक्रम इंडस्ट्री 4.0 पॉइंट जीरो द चैलेंज इज अड के सम्मेलन पर एक विशेष संदेश हमारे लिए भेजा है मैं अनुरोध करती हूं श्री विजय मित्तल जी माननीय संयुक्त सचिव भारी उद्योग मंत्रालय से कि वे प्रधानमंत्री जी का संदेश हमें पढ़कर सुनाएं श्री विजय मित्तल जी धन्यवाद वैशाली जी माननीय मंत्री जी के आदेश से मुझे ये सौभाग्य प्राप्त हुआ है कि ये माननीय प्रधानमंत्री जी का संदेश जो हमारे इस एक दिन के एक दिवसीय सम्मेलन इंडस्ट्री 4.0 के लिए प्रधानमंत्री कार्यालय से हमें भेजा गया है उसको मैं आप सबके समक्ष पढ़कर सुनाऊं प्रधानमंत्री मैसेज इट इज़ हार्टनिंग टू लर्न अबाउट द नेशनल कॉन्फ्रेंस on industry 4.0 challenges and way forward organized by ministry of heavy industries the selection of kevadia as venue of the conference provides the perfect backdrop for the conference the 21st century is an era of innovation and technological breakthroughs digital technology has today made deep inroads 
into the everyday life of common people as well as in industry. Our efforts are focused on leveraging technology for the larger benefit of people and resolve various challenges faced by them. During the last eight years, our resolute efforts have instilled a new confidence among the industry and enterprises. Powered by innovation and research, we have transformed various sectors, including industry, agriculture, infrastructure, MSMEs, and manufacturing. Industry 4.0, or the fourth industrial revolution, is as much about new technology as it is about innovative thinking. Due to various factors, India may have missed being a part of earlier industrial revolutions, but India has the potential to lead Industry 4.0 because for the first time in recent history, we have many different factors like demography, demand, and decisive governance coming together. It is in this context that we have worked on reforms and incentives to make India a tech-powered manufacturing hub of the world. The industry and our entrepreneurs play a particularly critical role in making India a vital link in global value chains. May the deliberations at the conference help in devising a strategic roadmap for the Indian industry to leverage technology to resolve challenges of the future as well as create new age opportunities for the youth of India. The Amrit Kal of the next 25 years is an opportunity for the industry to contribute substanti substantially to build a strong, self-reliant India. Best wishes to all for the success of this conference. Thank you. Pradhan Mantri Modi ji ke sandesh se is sammelan mein ek nai urja, ek nai shakti ka pravah hote huye. Mein aap sab se anurod karti hoon ki humare Pradhan Mantri ji ke liye ek baar zor dar taliyan. बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद आत्मनिर्भर भारत उत्पादन कंपनियों के लिए एक बड़ा अवसर है उत्पादन कंपनियां तेजी से महसूस कर रही हैं कि हमारे वर्तमान तंत्र में नई चुनौतियां आ रही हैं इन चुनौतियों का सामना करने के लिए नई सोच की ज़रूरत है इसीलिए समर्थ उद्योग की राष्ट्रीय पहल के तहत भारत भारी उद्योग मंत्रालय एम ने सी फोर लैब नामक इंजीनियरिंग और सुविधा केंद्र की स्थापना पुणे विश्वविद्यालय में की है सी फोर आई फोर लैब पुणे ने एक विश्व स्तरीय इंडस्ट्री 4.0 पॉइंट जीरो एक्सपीरियंस सेंटर की स्थापना की है और 9000 से ज़्यादा लोगों को इंडस्ट्री 4.0 के बारे में जागरूक करने का काम किया है और इसी श्रृंखला में मैं एक बार फिर हमारे मुख्य अतिथि महोदय डॉक्टर महेंद्र पांडे जी से निवेदन करती हूँ कि रिमोट का बटन दबा इस मॉडल फैक्ट्री का उद्घाटन करें माननीय डॉक्टर महेंद्रनाथ पांडे जी आप अपने स्क्रीन पर देख सकते हैं और ये सी फोर आई फोर मॉडल फैक्ट्री का उद्घाटन हमारे मुख्य अतिथि महोदय के कर कमलों द्वारा बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद महोदय Thank you, sir. This uh, model factory is more focused on like seeing is a believing. So people have been asking us what is called uh, smart factory. So we thought of setting up this uh, with MHI grant. Uh, we could achieve this. It's a end-to-end -end value chain, uh, right from customer experience to production management to maintenance areas to quality. Uh, there is a program called Quick Step. Quick is a fast step. Is a so lot of uh, applications are there. All modern technologies are on display. Uh, very interactive. Uh, people can 
come and learn themselves and uh, it's some actual live conditions are on display there this model factory was uh, made with the uh, involvement of all automation companies uh, startups uh, experts from industry for some of the automotive companies also contributed uh, in setting creating uh, some of the useful applications and uh, especially for uh, small and medium sized companies uh, this kind of uh, setups are very useful total uh, uh, the cost of uh, setting up this has been about uh, 2 crore rupees so thank you for inaugurating this. Thank you for your encouragement. Thank you, sir. So, this was a small presentation on C4I4 Lab. And in this shrankla, C4I4 Lab has an online assessment tool. I would like to ask you one time, our main director, that one time, press the button of the remote button and upload this online assessment tool. ऑनलाइन असेसमेंट टूल का अवलोकन मुख्य अतिथि महोदय डॉक्टर महेंद्रनाथ पांडे के कर कमलों द्वारा सर कंपनीज पूछती हैं कि हम ये इंडस्ट्री फोर जर्नी कैसे करें तो इसलिए एक वेब बेस्ड फ्री ऑनलाइन असेसमेंट मॉडल जनरेट किया है और एमएसएमई के लिए बहुत ही उपयोगी रहेगा थैंक यू बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद महोदय और अब एक बार रुक कर लेते हैं गुजरात के मुख्यमंत्री जी के कार्यालय का जहां पर ईवी बसेस का उद्घाटन होने जा रहा है माननीय प्रधानमंत्री श्री नरेंद्र मोदी जी के नेतृत्व में भारत सरकार ने इलेक्ट्रिक व्हीकल्स के ऊपर बहुत जोर दिया है एक प्रदूषण रहित स्वच्छ सुरक्षित एवं निर्मल वातावरण के लिए भारत सरकार इलेक्ट्रिक व्हीकल्स को अत्याधिक प्रोत्साहन दे रहा है और इसी कड़ी में आज हमारे यहाँ गुजरात में एवं कर्नाटक में 100 ईवी बसेस का उद्घाटन किया जाना है गुजरात में 75 ईवी बसेस का उद्घाटन किया जाना है तो मैं पहले अनुरोध करती हूँ हमारे गुजरात के मुख्यमंत्री श्री भूपेंद्र भाई पटेल से कि वे झंडा फहरा इन ईवी बसेस का उद्घाटन करें साथ ही अनुरोध करती हूँ हमारे मुख्य अतिथि महोदय डॉक्टर महेंद्रनाथ पांडे जी से कि वे भी इस झंडे को दिखाकर इन बसेस का उद्घाटन करें मंचासीन सारे अधिकारियों से भी मैं अनुरोध करती हूँ कि यह झंडा दिखाकर इन ईवी बसेस का उद्घाटन किया जाए यह पिचत्तर ईवी बसेस जो कि गुजरात राज्य रोड परिवहन सूरत नगर निगम एवं राजकोट नगर निगम द्वारा प्रदान की गई हैं आप सबसे अनुरोध है कि तालियों के साथ इस मौके का अभिनंदन करें यह ईवी बसेस जो कि एक स्वच्छ एवं शुद्ध वातावरण के लिए अत्यंत महत्वपूर्ण हैं और अब हम चलते हैं कर्नाटका की तरफ 
जहां 100 ईवी बसेस का उद्घाटन होना है और कर्नाटक के लोग हमारे साथ जुड़े हुए हैं 1000 से भी ज़्यादा लोग उपस्थित हैं और मैं माननीय मुख्य अतिथि महोदय एवं मंचासीन सभी अधिकारियों से अनुरोध करती हूं कि झंडा दिखाकर कर्नाटक में इन 100 ईवी बसेस का उद्घाटन करें आप अपने स्क्रीन पर देख सकते हैं ईवी बसेस का उद्घाटन हुआ है और ये बसेस रोल आउट की जा रही हैं भारत सरकार की फेम स्कीम के अंतर्गत यह योजना जिसमें कर्नाटक में 100 एवं गुजरात राज्य में 75 ईवी बसेस को रोल आउट किया गया है मैं हमारे मुख्य अतिथि महोदय एवं सभी मंचासीन अधिकारियों का बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद करना चाहूंगी धन्यवाद सर देवियों और सजनों आज का प्रथम सत्र यहीं समाप्त होता है अब मैं हमारे मुख्य अतिथि महोदय आदरणीय डॉक्टर महेंद्रनाथ पांडे जी से अनुरोध करती हूं कि इंडस्ट्री 4.0 के संदर्भ में जो प्रदर्शनी बाहर लगी है उसका उद्घाटन करने के लिए कृपया प्रदर्शनी की तरफ प्रस्थान करें एवं प्रदर्शनी के उद्घाटन के उपरांत डाइनिंग हॉल में चाय एवं स्नैक्स का प्रबंध है तो आप सबसे अनुरोध है कि हम एक छोटा सा ब्रेक लेंगे चाय के लिए डाइनिंग हॉल में जाएंगे प्रदर्शनी के उद्घाटन के बाद एवं अगली पैनल डिस्कशन के लिए फिर से यहाँ एकत्रित होंगे बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद आप सबसे अनुरोध है कि कृपया मुख्य अतिथि महोदय के साथ बाहर प्रदर्शनी की तरफ प्रस्थान करें
Hallo, hallo, tschick, tschick, hallo. Hallo, tschick, 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 hallo. Hallo, tschick, 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 hallo. Hallo, tschick, hallo. Hallo, tschick, hallo. Hallo, tschick, hallo. Hallo. Hallo, tschick. Hallo, hallo. Hallo. Guck mal, Chico, du. Hallo, hallo, check. Check this, hallo, hallo. Hallo, check, check, hallo, hallo. Hallo. Hallo, check, check. Hallo, hallo. Hallo. Hallo, hallo. Hallo, check. Check, hallo, hallo. Hallo, 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 check, check, hallo. Hallo, hallo. Hallo. Hallo, check. Check, hallo, hallo, hallo. Hallo, hallo. Hallo. Hallo, hallo. Check, hallo, check, check, check this, check, hallo, hallo, hallo.
vision of industry leaders towards implementing industry 4.0 aur is panel discussion ko moderate karenge shri dilip sahni managing director rockwell automation india private limited aap sab se anurodh hai ki kripya shri sahni ji ke liye zordar taaliyan aur is discussion mein pratibhagi rahenge shri samir prakash general manager and head of digital enterprise division digital industry siemens india Shri Madhul Sharma, Shri Mridul Sharma, Executive Vice President and Chief Digital Officer, Kirloskar Group. Kripya Taliyon ke saath humare panel discussion ke pratibhagiyon ka swagat kare. Shri Sandeep Goel, Senior Vice President, Heavy Forge Division, Bharat Forge. Dr. Ravindra Uthgikar, Vice President, Corporate Strategy and Marketing, Praj Industries. मैं श्री दिलीप स्थानी जी जो कि इस डिस्कशन के मॉडरेटर हैं से अनुरोध करती हूं कि कृपया इस पैनल डिस्कशन का आरंभ करें श्री दिलीप स्थानी जी थैंक यू थैंक्स अलॉट वैशाली फॉर द काइंड इंट्रोडक्शन रियली अप्रिशिएट इट एंड अ वेरी गुड गुड मॉर्निंग स्टिल टू ऑल द डिग्नेटरीज प्रेजेंट ओवर हियर ऑनरेबल मिनिस्टर मिस्टर सेक्रेटरी सर and the, uh, the the dignitaries present here today uh, it is such an honor for someone to be associated with the with industry and industry 4.0 for a few decades to see an entire day being devoted to industry 4.0 and how that is going to be really transforming the indian manufacturing scene take it to the next level so i'm honored and delighted to be given the opportunity to moderate this panel discussion about the vision of industry leaders on how to implement the the topic that has been chosen today for the full day conference industry 4.0 and the challenges that lie ahead i think is very apt because you know we've been we're not getting started with this this is already here we heard in the morning right from the very top of the country's leadership on the investments that have been made results that have already been achieved by implementing many of these technologies we've come out of the covid stages and we've seen the huge acceleration and the accelerated impact of digital on our lives and industry is 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 no stranger uh, uh, you know to to that either so what we should be talking about and we're going to be devoting the next one hour to explore along with my co-panelists the challenges that are encountered how can we actually leverage and wield the powers of industry 4.0 to take the indian manufacturing to the next level so that we can attain the vision of viksit bharat as we heard this morning right couple of things which you know my my key takeaways from this morning from the leadership messages uh, that uh, that that we heard a the role of manufacturing in leading the growth of uh, of our economy we heard about uh, the honorable uh, minister of state talking about the contribution of manufacturing going from 16% to 25% that just must happen not only because it's a nice number to have because that nice number also translates into the added impact to the overall economy and the other big benefit of the job creation right so so that is very very important but yet we are living through times where volatility and uncertainty has never been higher right and it is to be expected with all the events that are breaking out geopolitics supply chain disturbances chip shortages etc cetera, etc cetera, that this this somewhat chaotic chaotic operating conditions are going to stay here for a while right so on the one hand we are talking about taking manufacturing and and really getting it to a stage where it leads and not lags the growth of the overall economy but the second part is do that in an operating environment that is highly uncertain right and will probably continue to be this that way for some period of time now uncertainty is no stranger to the manufacturing industry to those of you sitting in the audience my colleagues here on the panel you know we've we've seen tsunamis and we've seen supply chain disturbances because of volcanic eruptions in some continent etc etc but what happened over the last couple of years was 
a confluence of all kinds of disturbances happening at the same time. There was a drop off in, in, in demand, there was a drop off uh, or, or, or disruption in, 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 in supplies, there is disruption in work, workforce, you could not have people in the factories. And you know, all around there was a log jam. But yet we sprung back during the COVID stages into, and some industries were producing nearly equivalent output as they used to do pre-COVID. And that happened because some of the industry leaders had already prepared themselves by embracing technology to deliver superior business outcomes, right? So this is real, this is already happening, but yet we are on the starting stages and we have a long way to go. So what I'm going to be doing here today is leveraging the brain trust that is available on the panel today and try and explore a few different dimensions, right, of how to make Industry 4.0 deliver for us that game-changing impact so that manufacturing can really become globally competitive in India. There's also another one element which we'll try and touch upon, which was made uh, a mention of in the morning, which is around the, 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 the net zero uh, uh, dimensions, the sustainability dimensions. So we'll try and see if we can touch upon all of that during the course of the next one hour. I'm honored also because the co-panelists here, they not only represent different personas, we have people who are digitization leaders, we have business leaders, we have technology uh, leaders all represented over here. So all in all, I'm looking forward to uh, you know, a vibrant dialogue. What we'll also try and do is, you know, we'll try and save some time towards the end for Q&A because we really would like to see, there are a lot of business leaders here in the audience and policy leaders. We would really try and see what are your perspective on some of the areas that we'll be discussing. So without any further ado, I'm gonna get started and uh, my first question, and we'll make it really quick, I want to come to a couple of you because the, the topic of discussion really is on the vision of industry leaders on how to implement Industry 4.0. So, Mridul, if I can get started with you, talk to us in a couple of minutes about what is your vision, what do you expect out of Industry 4.0? So while uh, Industry 4.0 is a very wide concept, uh, and uh, as you said, it has been around for quite some time. Uh, I believe the time has come uh, for India to uh, actually uh, straddle this and, uh, and move forward with this to its advantage. Uh, and why I say so is I think uh, now is the opportunity and time uh, which is coming India's way, what came to India in the services industry on the manufacturing side with the geopolitical situation that is developing. And if we can uh, actually put the right foot forward, and I think today's event and uh, what the government is trying to put up, push forward, and the industry, you know, moving hand in hand, uh, what our honorable minister stated about, you know, on the PLI schemes, how things have come together, uh, I think it is the right moment. Now, specifically on Industry 4.0, we have a lot of industry, and I representing, I'm representing Kirloska Group, which has been around for 100 plus years. Um, and, we, and all the industry leaders uh, created products to bring technology to Indian shores so that our dependence on imports go down. In some areas, we also went ahead and actually took a leadership position in the world. Uh, today, I think what we as a group are looking forward to is that how our products are competitive technologically in two ways. One is our operations connected. Uh, because we have to competi be competitive in the international markets, that means our efficiency has to be the highest level. And to manage our efficiency at the highest level, whether you are a small business owner or a large business owner, you need to know in real time what is happening. Traditionally, uh, in our industries, we have always got to know stuff after a gap. Uh, and that does not help because, you know, the water has flown, water has flown. So how do we connect our operations using Industry 4.0 so that we can manage our capacities, our logistics, supply chain, production planning, all in real time, right to the top that we know, and nobody has to translate anything in between. Second major uh, objective uh, that I would say we should all uh, focus on 
which we see happening in our real lives, right? Our mobile phones, which we have got so used to now, they are connected products. This mobile phone is continuing to talk back to its manufacturer on a daily basis. And this smartphone, while the hardware stays the same, its functionality changes by the software update that comes on top. And I think that is the large challenge of Industry 4.0 when we talk of cyber physical system, that while the hardware can remain the same, the software lends a totally different capability and dimension to it on a daily basis. Uh, and if we can, and that is what we are also trying to do, is that if we now make sure that our products are connected, and with the coming of the 5G, uh, even if there are certain challenges, I believe that is something that can be taken care of when our assets are on the move. They can still continue to communicate with the control center, wherein they can communicate back their performance, their health, and one contribute to improvement of the product because this would be real data from the field, not a shop floor data. And second is, from a central place, we can continue to push updates, continue to you know, find errors, correct them, what can be done on the software, and make sure that our machine that we produce is much more efficient. It is happening in transport systems today. Fleet owners are trying to manage and maintain, but maybe it is a one-way communication. So these are the two things, uh, Dilip, what I would say from Industry 4.0 sure. is connected products and connected operations. Thank, thank you so much for those insights, um, Ridul. Competitiveness, efficiency, and then uh, the insights that you share. I'm going to come back to you that uh, later in the, in the discussion. I'm going to jump to the other end of the spectrum. Ravindra, I'm going to bring you in. What is your vision? What are your expectations out of Industry 4.0 uh, for, for your business and industry overall? Thank you. Uh, I clearly feel Industry 4.0 is an idea whose time has come. And let me explain. India is blessed with highest demographic dividend, great technology capabilities, fantastic logistic network. There is nothing holding us back in unleashing our prowess. And above all, there is an incredible leadership uh, coming right from the top to give this sector a thrust. What we experience is that post-pandemic, all the global conglomerates are exploring China plus one strategy that opens another window of opportunities for the India to chip in. And the government has sensed this and uh, fantastic schemes like Make in India for the world, also for the domestic market, PLI, are the, just the right catalyst for us to actually unleash the progress of manufacturing sector. So I really feel that we are at the cusp of a, 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 a step change in, the, in terms of our manufacturing outlook. I represent a process and project industry which is somewhat late to take off, unlike an organized sector like automobile or pharmaceutical, uh, where there is an organized manufacturing. But you know, we are quick to catch on. And pandemic taught us that so many things can be done using technology. And Industry 4.0, as we all know, is a confluence of nine technologies which are at different stages of maturity. But project and process industry has quickly latched on to remote monitoring, artificial intelligence, data analytics, some of the simulation aspects to make sure that the product throughput is maximized, to make sure that the downtime is minimized, the ex operations are accident free, and obviously we are able to lower our carbon uh, footprints. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But I think uh, we as a project or process industry are also gearing up very fast. And at Praj, we have solutions that can actually step change uh, in terms of process industry's outlook to technology and help us achieve more in terms of contribution to the GDP, Dilip. Thank you so much, Ravindra. Samir, I'm going to bring you in now. Now, as a global technology provider, uh, you are you're no stranger to Industry 4.0. You've seen various dimensions and stages of impact inside and outside of India. Specific to the context of India, what's your vision? What do you expect? Industry 4.0 and the impact that it can create to get us started. So if I look at it from the perspective of India, uh, one of the key aspects which we need to take care of when you're talking about Industry 4.0 is to address some of the key areas or challenges which today the manufacturing industry in India is facing to become competitive. And some of the examples which also was mentioned by my co-panelists, some to add to that is something on the time to market. Now, consumer products, Take an example in FMCG, you take example of uh, any consumer fast clothing in the form of soaps or shampoos and all. People want 
new products on a very regular basis. Now, this is one of the challenge for the manufacturing industry because they have to gear up their production lines as well as their product design in a way that they can deliver this. Another area is the flexibility in the manufacturing line. Today, it is not just manufacturing one particular product, you need one manufacturing line. You need a line which is flexible to take care of many variations in the product. Now, this is all these key challenges, and to that, if you add the sustainability angle, you add the efficiency angle, you see that the challenges are many, and Industry 4.0, I feel, is the only way how this can be implemented, and this can be taken care of. And that is one of the key aspects which we want to drive also in India, ensure that acceptability of Industry 4.0 in the manufacturing industry grows, and that is where we talk about the ecosystem, we talk about MHI, which has been contributing to a lot in the COEs which have come in because they are really the incubators and the areas where all the companies can test out their use cases and scale it. Industry is a 4.0 is a journey and it will never happen that everything will work at one stage. It has to be done step by step. But the most important part of this and which is one of our vision also is companies need to start making their blueprint of digital transformation. It's not a big thing. Someone was talking in the morning, I think it was the C4, I4, they talked about digital maturity assessment. Now many industry associations are offering digital maturity assessments. Companies like uh, C4, I4 is doing that. Many of our technology players here are doing that, but this is one of the key important steps. First for you to understand where you stand today uh, in the global arena, and then from there you build up the story of how to implement in what stages so that you get the best benefit out of it. That's all sure. Thank, thank you, Samir. So the, the, the dimensions of you know, fast changing and aggressively growing consumer demands, flexibility, and the dimension of Industry 4.0 being a journey. So we'll explore these, uh, these dimensions as we come forward. I'm going to turn to you now, Sandeep, because you represent a totally different dimension. You are a real business leader. You use these technologies to create real business impact. And I'm going to look towards you to talk to us about how have you made this real in your world, you know, uh, and you handle some, you, you produce some very large size capital goods, uh, several tons and, and, and so forth. The stakes are really high and the challenges that your business was encountering was significant. So, so walk us through what were some of these challenges and how have you actually really been able to realize benefit out of this journey? Uh, you uh, you know, we have been implementing uh, Industry 4.0 in Bharat Force in the last four years. Almost all our presses today are Industry 4.0 compliant. But I will talk to you about uh, one of the presses where I was personally involved. That was our heavy point division. We have a 4,000 ton press capable of forging 40 tons of single piece ingot weight. Our environments are very harsh because of the size of forging as well as the temperature of uh, forging, which is also around 1250 degrees centigrade. And also, if the condition of the presses or maybe the furnace temperature is not right, you will have a lot of quality issues into the forging. And each of these forgings are sometimes could be very expensive. And it is very pertinent to have what is really important for you uh, or what is the real condition of your equipments at the time of forging. So this was one of our main point why we went for industry 4.0 in our division but we wanted to have zero downtime unplanned downtime so to implement this we thought of you know phasing implementation of industry 4.0 in our in our division in three phases first phase was to train on manpower because there is always a fear of technology in the teams who are going to actually do it on the shop so we created iot labs where in the entire team, there was not option to anybody. Everybody from the plant head to the last engineer would have to go through this training. So we trained our teams for pneumatics, hydraulics, electronics, robotics, and coupled with it, the sensor technology. How to couple sensors along in these processes and take benefit out of it. In second phase, we put sensors on all our press lines, on the critical uh, points of the press to measure temperatures, vibrations, pressures, or maybe the oil quality. And in the third phase, we created a digital twin in a control room. Now, what, when the press was working on the shop floor, we were taking out, out the, all the data from the sensors and migrating it to 
the control room along with our uh, uh, what is a circuits for hydraulic circuits as well as electronic circuits so in other words we were able to pinpoint the exact real time working of a press condition of the press at that and this has benefited us tremendously it, if any of our uh, signals or parameters are going out of the specified range our maintenance team, maintenance team used to get an alert and from the control room we could pinpoint where the problem is how fast we can quickly check it up or uh, how, how it could be very quickly dealt with so i'll say you know today in our division we have almost zero hydraulic downtime zero electronic downtime breakdown downtime our mechanical maintenance downtime has come from 8% to 3% our uh, quality of parts has significantly improved our energy cost has come down our uh, operational efficiency has increased so i'll say there's a tremendous benefits we can drive from industry 4.0 sure no thank you so much these are very impressive figures sandeep uh, congratulations on that first of all and uh, you alluded to this three phase journey uh, you know starting with creating these labs that you did which is kind of like the comment that you were making you know building a a blueprint so i'm going to come to both of you later on and try and explore that but uh, samir i want to also bring you in on this one because your own factory in kalwa you all have been through that journey and you've also seen some real benefits do you want to touch upon that uh, real yeah, quick yeah, here sure, yeah. sure. so i mean uh, kalwa i mean just to give you first the starting point of our journey in the kalwa factory this is a 45 year plus old uh, factory which uh, manufactures low voltage switchgear now i'm uh, insisting that uh, it's an old uh, factory because most of the installations in india of the manufacturing will be brownfields and they will be existing installations which are there for many years so this journey what we undertook there for industry 4.0 is something which gives a very clear cut idea of how one can implement it successfully and can also be scaled up with in many other areas so the so starting point was we had around 77 different products of switchgear which were getting manufactured there and we were using three manufacturing lines to do that and of course with that uh, was coming all the complexities of managing the whole line in a very uh, structured way now with the changing demands of the market the the switchgear requirements had to be increased further that means you need to introduce more products in the same manufacturing line but at a very optimum cost increase so that means we had to increase the product variations from 77 to on, around 180 so we wanted to introduce 180 finally new products and existing we were having three lines to manufacture 77 but now comes the challenge we wanted the three lines to be reduced to one and ensure that the same variations of the manufacturing are taken care of and this is only possible when we go with the digital enterprise approach or the industry 4.0 approach what we do is basically we strongly believe that an industry 4.0 initiative has to cut across the value chain of the manufacturing process right from product design to production planning then you have the production execution production engineering and then the services and this once you have that concept in mind we are able to ensure that all these benefits of creating a digital backbone weaving a digital thread across the five stages of the manufacturing that is nothing but creating a digital twin which uh, my co panelist was talking about this digital twin gives you a very big benefit you have the digital twin of the product which you want to manufacture and the production line you can do all your simulations you can test it simulate it do all the what if scenarios there remotely without putting a single rupee into the actual physical uh, contents there so all being done in the virtual environment once you are satisfied then you deploy it onto the shop floor and this saves a lot of time a lot of time on prototyping and all this goes away so this was one of the key benefits which we were able to achieve once we get got into our industry 4.0 journey another big benefit was of course the productivity improved and we were able to get more variations on one single line we were able to get a batch size because that is where the vagaries or the uh, uncertainties of the demand we have to take care from the market we could have a manufacturing batch size of one piece to 1000 to 2000 pieces on the same line because now with the digital twin available and the technology of automation available i could produce one piece of switchgear at the price 
which is similar to that of a single unit price as compared to a price of a 2,000 numbers which are getting produced. So this is the flexibility which you could build in there. That was a big advantage there. And finally, because it used all the industry 4.0 standards, the initial product was only for the Indian market. Now this switchgear which we are producing, these variations, they're all for the global market also. So it opened up a huge amount of market for Siemens when they embarked on this journey. So that's just the experience which we have got. V very impressive. So 45-year-old line, yeah. you collapsed three lines into one, yeah. took the variants from 70 odd to 180, yeah. and uh, you really opened up a brand new global market as well. So very, very impressive. Okay, so I'm going to now segue into uh, a whole new dimension, and Mridul, I'm going to come to you, because all of these benefits that all the panel panelists have spoken about, yourself included, these benefits are all real. Yet Industry 4.0, it's a journey, and it requires us to transform ourselves because we had to do things in a very different manner. So in a sense, you're leveraging technology to create a whole different set of business outcomes, but you have to do it very differently, right? McKinsey's study uh, published recently showed that 70% uh, or more of these transformational undertaking across the world, this is not India data, this is the global data, do not live to uh, see the light of the, you know, the fruit of the benefits, right? Uh, they don't make it to the finish line. And I would like to talk to you about what are some of the changes or the challenges that are to be expected in this journey, right? Uh, as you set out to achieve superior business outcomes, right? And you are the chief digital officer of your organization. You are no stranger to these challenges. So I wanted to start with you. Uh, your, your thoughts or perspectives on that? So I'll try to bring to a very simple level, you know, the way we see things in our own lives, you know, in personal lives also. And that is what actually manifests at a, you know, a large enterprise or at a, you know, country level. So we are talking of cyber physical systems here. All of us have operated machinery. So for example, we drive cars on a daily basis. It's a machinery that all of us know, and we know how to drive it. We are trained to do that. Uh, now, if we talk of a car like Tesla, wherein there is a software layer, a predominant software layer, every car has a software layer, on top of the hardware. Uh, so one is that we first need to get used to kind of saying that, you know, maybe this car can drive on its own. Now here there is a very key notion, and that key notion is not new. Uh, the notion of thinking machines. Traditionally, we always thought that machines do repetitive mechanical jobs. Thinking is done by human beings, the operators, the managers, supervisors, because human beings can only think. But today, I think the time has come when we have to get it in our head that machines can also think. And they will sometimes take decisions which can be superior than an average human being because that thinking has been done by the, I would say, the knowledge of the crowds when we talk of the concepts of AI and ML, it is about putting a lot of that learning into the machine, but the machine at that point in time can process a lot more data and variables than what a human being can do. And maybe that is what takes us above, you know, a 95% level. So it is always, you know, say the last, you know, last 5% is very difficult because if you talk to any plant engineer today who has worked 40 years, they are very accomplished. They know a lot of stuff. They can hear something and tell you what is wrong. But then what happens, that thing peaks out at a particular level and maybe we think that's the best. Now, if we are able to combine that knowledge together, and if I take the example, say, of medical systems also today, you know, if you talk of an oncologist, maybe there are few good oncologists who can look at a scan and do the detection. But do we have those oncologists in every village today? Can we do that? The way is that can we do that in a hub and spoke model where the knowledge can actually get combined of all these oncologists into a machine and the input is given in and the machine can tell you this is the best way forward for us, right? So I think that is something from a cyber physical standpoint that we have to accept the notion of thinking machine, yeah. Yeah, which, which was founded so many years back, but we didn't have the computing power maybe to put into motion. Second part there is that uh, go with the low hanging fruit. When you talk of the concept saying that, you know, 70% of stuff does not leave, because we do a lot of uh, uh, stuff for the show of it, uh, for the jing jingles and bells and, you know, just 
put up a big show and then, you know, whether it actually, I would say if we do small stuff, talk to the plant managers and say, what are your basic problems? And we st start with the low hanging fruit. What it does is that it actually brings in that ownership and it brings in uh, the participative uh, nature wherein they say, okay, this was our machine. Tha. So the concept is that, can we turn human beings into superhumans? And this JCB example, driver was there, or maybe somebody had to dig a road, they can do as much. You combine that human being with a little bit of knowledge on a JCB machine, see what he, this guy can do. And this guy will be a happy man because he would have done so much in a day that he goes home happy, saying I've been so productive. So that is the second part is that how do we make sure that machines are not going to take away human jobs, they will make human beings superhuman. So today, for example, all of you here with your computing devices, with your cell phones, you are much more productive, right? So we felt, you know, in our industry when, for example, computerization first started coming, there were, you know, always concepts saying, you know, it will take away jobs. I would say we have to get away from that saying they will make us much better. They will make our quality of lives much better. So these are the two things I would say that, you know, once you seep that in, sure. uh, you are able to do much more and much faster. Correct, correct. No, thank you so much for those insights. Uh, you know, both the aspects that you brought about, brought about is, first of all, us accepting that machines are capable of a lot more. So we give them the space to do uh, and deliver the value which, which, which they can for us. But the other thing also is start small. And uh, the participative nature of uh, uh, bringing the actual shop floor owners in, make them a part of the solution, not leave them as a part of the problem. Excellent insights. Thanks so much for that. Uh, Ravindra, I want to come to you, because when we talk about managing change, you know, if this is a change journey altogether, and if you have to deli deliver superior outcomes, those outcomes cannot be superior if we do not take the sustainability aspects into account. I know you're very passionate about that area, and I wanted to pick your brains on that aspect. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think let me just say that Honorable Minister spoke about um, India's Panchamrut agenda tabled at COP26 summit. And we are exactly a month away from COP27 summit being held at Cairo. And we have a roadmap laid out where we have to fulfill those obligations. But just stepping back, uh, sustainability in everything that we do is extremely important. Industry and transportation are top two consumers of fossil fuel-based energy and also top two emitters of greenhouse gases. So we have to make all-out effort to see how we can deal with the decarbonization of the sector. But I want to go one step forward. Whether you are a publicly listed company wanting to restructure capital or expand your footprint, whether you are a privately held company wanting to go public, or whether you are a startup wanting to raise capital, the investor fraternity will evaluate you through the ESG lens. So we have to now start thinking as to how Industry 4.0 will support the ESG. And environmental social governance is the ESG, which is the new mantra. In fact, uh, already the business responsibility and sustainability report, BRB, BRSR, is mandatory for top 1,000 listed companies starting next year. And this is going to only follow. So as a manufacturer, how are we treating our waste, our effluent, our energy footprint, our utility footprint, our water footprint? How are we conscious of uh, environmental impact that we leave? As far as the society is concerned, are we creating jobs at the bottom of the pyramid? Are we helping the uh, equal, are we being equal opportunity employer? Are there is a right representation of uh, uh, gender equality? Are we making sure that the institutions and the societies which are working for a welfare cause are well supported by the organizations? That's the social aspect. And the last aspect is the governance aspect. And we are all, when you talk of governance, uh, infamous examples that come to mind is a deep well oil spill of BP and also uh, the uh, Volkswagen diesel gate incidents where some of the incidences were not brought to the fore. So how Industry 4.0 comes in here? Because Industry 4.0 will help process analyze data at real time. So it will make you aware of you know, whatever you can measure, you can manage. So the first step is measurement. And then you can probably take steps 
to correct those uh, you know aspects unless you are esg compliant you will not be able to attract new top quality talent to the to the to the organization you will not be able to partner with the global institutions in the evaluation index there is always a questionnaire these days how esg compliant you are and we are going to see that going forward this is only going to grow so if manufacturing sector harnesses the prowess of digital technology and there are as i said there are nine aspects of industry 4.0 which are at different phases of maturity and we can harness in bits and pieces to our need we will be able to better uh, manage our uh, Uh, our environmental impact we will be able to better manage our social impact and also the governance impact so i think the sustainability aspect is a very important aspect and very important consideration as we go into this uh, industry 4.0 journey thank you so much tabendra clearly your passion comes through um, and i think the the element that you brought in of <laughs> industry 4.0 enabling the industry at large to yeah. achieve sustainability ESG and ESG you know, compliance and yes. ESG compliance you know uh, very very beautifully done so i want to switch to another one uh, dimension when we talk about indian manufacturing you have to put the spotlight on msmes and india has something upwards of about 2 crore msme manufacturing oriented units and msmes and many of these are very successful very well run businesses but they are also very conscious about uh, about investments and about uh, uh, you know intense capex investments uh, in in uh, resource heavy undertakings uh, you know amongst other things and yet at the same time we just barely coming out of the covid related uh, financial distress which was most felt by by msme companies so you know some of them are still coming out of those those stages samir i want to come to you next and you know you work quite a lot with the with the uh, uh, msme sector i want to know from you do industry 4.0 undertakings always have to be very heavy capex intensive undertakings or is there a way around it and are cloud based technologies or some of the other things that we hear about are they making it easier for msmes to embrace some of these technologies and and deliver the superior outcomes we've been talking about yeah coming uh, i mean this is one of the important very important aspect uh, if we want to really become a, a very serious player globally in the manufacturing into space because msmes the adoption of industry 4.0 by msmes is the key differentiator where we will be able to do that we will have all the big companies doing it but msmes is the key and they are large numbers of that and that is where the encouragement of the ecosystem has to be there for them now as uh, from our experience has been that msmes have to very clearly start it as a journey they need to take small steps and then scale up if you try to do everything together and this has been our experience with we talk with uh, when we have been interacting with many of them then the many times you don't see the benefits coming out of it so start small and then scale that is one of the key aspects of uh, how you go about it because digitalization anyway is a journey and for that uh, the first step would be the maturity assessment where you have a lot of uh, tools available then from there you decide which is that part of the business or that area of your process where you will get the best return on investments and then from getting that then you go to the next steps and uh, this is not a long term uh, it's not a story where you take long number of years to implement it we know of many machine builders one in the i can give you some examples without taking names there is a machine builder who is making a lot of uh, machines for the cable industry electrical cables and this guy uh, they used to make their machines all over the they go all over the world and india of course there is a lot of presence there once they sell their machines uh, which is a highly automated machine they would just go into standard annual maintenance contracts for its maintenance but with the industry 4.0 aspect being built into it and when they realize that once they start capturing data of the health of this machine on a continuous basis and this is where iiot came into picture so they ensure that all their machines which are going to their customers they are getting data on a regular basis continuous basis where this data is getting connected to the cloud which they have got access to 
And the data collection is not the only thing. That is not the real purpose. The purpose is after you collect this data, the insights which you get from this data, you are able to use that to improve the design of your machine, the design or the applicability on the production side of the machine. Not only that, he was that customer specifically was able to also improve the service calls which he had to do because now he was able to know exactly what is the problem because he was having a lot of online uh, information there. He could take very clear decisions, fast response times. And uh, these were some of the key benefits which he could observe or get. And this is applicable for any machine builder. I can, we have at least five, 10 such machine builders who are already embarked on that journey. And I can tell you the scalability, the way you do it, and now comes the next part of it. Over a period of time, technology companies like us all have also started moving to uh, cloud options. That is, you don't need to buy perpetual licenses for anything of digitalization going ahead. Now, perpetual licenses are more expensive if you compare it with a cloud option where you have a subscription model. So there, you will be only charged based on the what you use there. So based on the usage of that license or that particular aspect of your cloud offering, only then you will get charged. And that brings in down a lot of investments now for the SMEs. And the third part is, of course, which I referred to before also, use our COEs which are there all over the world, all over the country, through thanks to MHI, use them to create all this, uh, use them to build up your cases, your use cases, your all, things which you want to try to develop all your solutions of taking care of all your problems there. So once you do these four, three, four things, I don't see any challenge uh, for the MSMEs also to embark on this journey. And last point is, whether we like it or not, we, if we have to survive in this very competitive global economy, MSMEs have to embark on this journey. They can take their, they can choose their speed and how they do it, but they have to do it. That's sure. No, thanks for that, Sameer. And I agree with your comments on, uh, you know, thinking about scalability, starting small, particularly about cloud. I think that is going to be creating a, a massive disruption because scale is no longer an advantage that the big organizations have. The smaller companies, MSMEs in particular, can actually leapfrog because they have the agility, right? And they don't have legacy infrastructure to worry about and carry it along with them. As a, as a burden, which, which might be the case for some of the larger organizations. So this is an, an exciting opportunity for all the participants, I would like to say, is we should think about it as a major disruption that is happening. And if you are an MSME, a business leader, you should be thinking about how to take advantage of it. Okay, now I'm gonna to switch to another uh, dimension. And this is about the transformation and business models that is happening around us. Right. Just during the COVID times, we got to witness how quickly uh, e-commerce really, you know, surrounded us from every dimension. Right. We are getting things delivered to our doorsteps, and uh, that really went from you know something which was a little bit of a fad to something which we were heavily dependent on. And now, coming out of the pandemic stages, we're being literally spoiled as consumers by the promises of 19 minutes delivery, 10 minutes delivery, what have you. Right. Now, what this is doing is consumers are really, really being given, and they're spoiled for choice, but manufacturers, particularly those who are dependent on, uh, or who, was in, who are in consumer-facing industries, they are having to very quickly think of their business supply chains and, and entire enterprise-level business models in a, in a whole different light, because all of a sudden, if material needs to be delivered and at, at that speed, someone else is going to come and disrupt you if you do not think about disrupting yourself. So business models are getting disrupted like never before. And Mridhal, I want to bring you in on, on, uh, on this one because I know you've already been thinking about big capital goods that your company produces and you used to ship them out and that used to be the last you would see of them, but now you're taking you're engaged with that asset once it is deployed wherever it is in the country or outside, and you're looking at it from a holistic life cycle perspective, and that's a whole new business model. So I want to bring you in on that and, uh, and, and uh, you know, take your thoughts on it. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll 
share that example with the audience uh, in a while, but I just want to you know bridge to when we talk of digitalization, right? And I talked of saying don't do it for the bells and whistles. Uh, I think it is very, very important that when we do anything on digital and when any, uh, say, a plant manager or a business manager says that, you know, this is a project I want to do, people will look at financial viability of that, right? That means either it increases your top line or reduces your bottom line and increases the margin. Now, in doing that, it is very important that when we do something digital, it creates value and revenue, both. Anything which does not create revenue and value will not stay. It has to feed itself, right? The good part, what he also talked of, is that today, with the stuff available on rent, so when I talk of cloud and stuff, it is you can rent it out, and which is unleashed a lot of stuff. You know, any kid with a credit card in the pocket today can start a supercomputer in five minutes from the mobile phone, which maybe needed 50 crores, you know, 20 years back. And that is why, you know, they couldn't test those ideas. Today, you know, if you have a mobile phone and a credit card, you can start and Correct. test your idea in five minutes and say whether it will work or not. And you only pay 5,000 rupees for that. Correct. Now, that's the power that is coming our way. Now, using that power, I think what we try to solve here is that when products move out, and in your con personal lives, you do feel that products continue to update themselves. Mobile phone is one example. Software updates come. Cars have started updating themselves. And slowly, we'll see features coming on there. Uh, we need to know how that product is behaving on the ground and if there is a critical outcome of that machine, you need to fix that before it breaks down. So what we do is preventive maintenance in our plants. How do we do it for the products that got shipped out? Uh, so for us, the problem statement was say power generation equipment, gen sets. You know, Kirloskar oil engines produces gen sets of various configurations. Now they are sometimes deployed in far off locations. Uh, so for let's say example, you know, 50 kilometers from Kevadia, in some place, there is a genset. Now, if that genset breaks down, there is some critical uh, you know, application of that. And somebody to come and fix it, it's a two to, two to three day affair. Yep. Now, what we started doing in that is that put an IoT sensor. The IoT sensor continuously relays two packets per minute back to us. It sends us all the critical parameters. Using that data, we collected that data over a two year period from a lot of field gen sets. So we had critical data. Then we fed that into an AI ML model to say learn and ask the engineer, what is it that you want to track? Now, the moment you go into data science, you have to then you know, do a kind of you know, a sangam there because yeah. our data scientists will not understand what is the correlation between a, you know, oil temperature okay. you know, <laughs> and pressure and stuff. So you tell him that. And so you, it is like you know, putting that biotechnology together, two fields, mission of that two. And they say, can you solve this problem? Technology is available, right? You have the data, you got the technology. And then we said, OK, try to see, can you predict this failure in looking at the patterns? And then we started seeing light. It took time. But then that model learned itself, and we had to try various things, that we said 20 hours before the failure, one by one, fan belt failure, you know, oil, uh, you know, uh, the, the, in, you know, the injection system failure, battery failure, whatever. So we had the failure modes, and then we started predicting them one by one. And then we tested, because the false positives have to be low, and you know the prediction rate has to be high. And we could slowly, slowly, as more data started coming, we. So today, this is now in, 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 in production. So we today, sitting centrally, can predict a failure and tell the owner, saying, Aapka ye kharab hone wala, main ko pehle bhej So look at the, you know, the one, the customer experience in all of that. Uh, and look at that, you know, you have averted a failure. Correct. Even if you are able to, you know, predict it to 80% efficiency, it is something great. See if something like that can happen to you as a car driver. You have to go on a critical journey and the manufacturer calls up, sir, aapka aane wala hai, service station gaadi laga lo, aapka fan belt jane wala hai. So, you know, you have averted a major catastrophe on that. This is, I would say, what we should work towards. It is possible. If it can happen for the mobile phone, it can happen for any large equipment. Because the sensors are there, networks are there. No, it's, it's beautiful, think, the amount you know, of... The, the, yeah. this, uh, this is a great point. Uh, I just want to build on that, that yeah. what basically Mridul is saying, that you can do a life cycle analysis yeah. and predict the cost of ownership. Yeah. You know, so often, and I think uh, you, know, you spoke about how MSME can leverage. So if we have these digital tools, perhaps the decisions of 
how the investments will pay back over a period of uh, you know its life cycle and what are the costs that will uh, that are likely to get incurred is something which you know beforehand and that is a magic of data science so i think that's that's a and, great and point and see yeah. finally it is saying use the technology to solve a problem real problem yeah. you know yeah. create create something right yeah. in in my previous life i did something similar to that is that see today in atms aap jate ho atm pe aap bolte ho ki mere ko aaj 100 ka note chahiye it gives you that in that same combination right 500 or so you know this is a real need sometime you need that how do you get it so you know we created something like that on atm saying that aap apna denomination fit karo aapko itna 100 ka chahiye itna 50 ka chahiye itna 500 it will give you that now very simple thing but yeah. does that solve the problem for a customer very good and you're talking about technology not being an end to itself but technology being means to the end the end being that value that you're talking about beautifully conveyed So I'm going to now come to you, Sandeep. So we started with you, and you spoke about what you've been able to do and the huge impact you've been able to create in your business. Zero downtime, and you brought down the mechanical downtimes from you said eight percent to to three percent, and that is that is non-trivial. I mean, that is significant. What I want to talk with you is: Are you stopping here, or are there other ideas that are, you know? Uh, bustling through your mind i mean what what's next how do you want to exploit technology to create um, you know even better outcomes i guess uh, you know uh, i like to say here that now we have sensors on the system th those who are dumping us with data and today probably you know once we have reached a particular critical point now we are not able to know what to do with this data so uh, there are issues you know uh, now we are getting into preventive analytics so what we are saying is now either we study a failure and what was the signature of the signals before that either we create a, you know uh, a once a failure happens then we study what the signal signature was telling us or else now we need to create you know when the press is on idle time remove two bolts and see if the if the vibration goes particular by the next numbers then what it uh, can cause a failure so right now we are in a phase of preventing analytics use and then probably if we can understand that then probably we like to feed it into our uh, uh, machines that are you know artificial intelligence tell us that now maybe two months later or a four months or four years later or maybe uh, this failure is going to happen so probably we are a missed preparing some of this analytic preventive uh, signatures or maybe understanding of the data right now so we are going through that phase right now exactly the the kind yeah. of thing that we've right. spoken about right. here right. So for us also the situation was similar that our guys were sitting with you know i i call it the recurring deposit right. they are depositing but they don't know what it will mature to sure. so you know people were sitting see what do we do with this yeah. so you know when i moved in they said can you shine some light on this yeah. so i said okay good is let's start looking at what is and whenever you look at you know these deposits you find quality issues and other stuff but the point is the moment you start at least you know have a sizable one you put it into ai ml model modeling the machine will show you various correlations yeah. right i'll give you one example from a very different world in the world somewhere when they ran that correlations on small value loans they found a correlation between default rates and the battery capacity of the mobile phone <laughs> you can't think of it right yeah, yeah. ki aapka mobile phone ka jo battery capacity hai usse default rate kaise predict karunga but they found out maybe it is dependent on what is the kind of model of mobile you can buy what cost price it is and there is some correlation but otherwise we cannot ever find out right so when you put this you know 200 variables into a machine and the technology is there and the computing power is there sometimes it shows you some bizarre stuff which you could never think of yeah great no excellent these have been very great insights So before I move to the Q and A round, I'm going to come to you, uh, Ravindra, and I'll come to each one of the panelists. Uh, this is going to be a bit of a rapid fire. Uh, you each have one minute, but I would like to know from you. And Sandeep has already shared with us what is he thinking about. But is there a pet project that you are working on, or your organization is working on, that you're deeply excited about? And and what outcomes do you expect? Well, oh, this is this is not a one minute one. question, really. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, so going forward, I think because yeah. um, uh, this is like industry 4.0 challenges and way forward. So way forward is twofold. One is industry 5.0, and again, ushering is metaverse. 
that's a little bit long shot. But, you know, if we reflect, all industrial, earlier industrial revolutions have given us a lot to cheer for. Yeah. You know, GDP growth, poverty eradication, mortality reduction, prosperity, and so on and so forth. But all this has come at the expense of environment. And we are seeing that, that studies have established that the climate change has roots in a mindless consumption of energy and therefore induced greenhouse gases. So we have to take cognizance of how we can overcome that. Second, uh, we have often seen that industrial automation or the industrial evolutions have costed loss of jobs. And therefore, people have mental health issues. In fact, uh, there is already a concept of universal basic income that is being mooted even in India, where you, know, you don't have to do anything, but you'll be provided some money back home to only maintain yourself. So these are the challenges of earlier revolution. So the concept of 5.0 enhanced version actually aligns with uh, you know, collaborative robots. So basically robots that interact with humans, they will do the tactical job. Human beings will do transformational job and circular bioeconomy. So we are talking about farm to farm. So basically bioeconomy is actually products, goods, services made from biological resources. Now we all studied in the school that you know plants absorb carbon dioxide and when goods produced from plants or agriculture when consumed emit carbon dioxide. So you are actually creating a carbon neutral cycle. So we have the next industrial revolution which is already being tied and we are working very strongly on is actually a concept of industry 5.0 enhanced version where bioeconomy and collaborative robots are aligned to the industrial evolution to strike a fine balance between people, planet, and profit. So we are looking for sustainable fuels, which is biofuels is just one example. Uh, compressed biogas, you have, uh, instead of compressed natural gas, you have compressed biogas. Instead of, um, it, uh, instead of uh, gasoline, you have ethanol blended gasoline, yeah. is one example. Or you have sustainable materials. The materials which are coming from hydrocarbon route, you now have comi them coming from carbohydrate carbohydrate route. So you are a little bit moving a shift to a more sustainable economic cycle. So that's the next thing that we are working on. Uh, I saw Dr. Matai from ARI also. We are working with them for low carbon fuels. Yeah. There is so much to do in this space. So I think the future is very exciting. Technology is there. How we can make the technology affordable and proliferate to the last, uh, you know, bottom of the pyramid is a question. You, you are bustling with ideas, and I'm sure that you're working 18 hours a day. Great, great. Thanks for sharing those thoughts. Samir, uh, one thing. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, for me, the next step is more of, uh, which is one of the important aspects of Industry 4.0 is the ecosystem. So we are doing a lot now to strengthen the ecosystem in the country itself. So when we talk about Industry 4.0 and we talk about ecosystems, it is not just one supplier or one company who will be able to do everything to address the challenges of the Industry 4.0. So ecosystem will involve consultants, you will have the COEs, you will have technology players, and you will have all this to be done in a tandem, in a very collaborative way. And that is something which is going to get uh, driven much more in the coming days. That's all for my side. Sure. Thank you, Samir. Last one from, uh, from you, Mridul. The yeah. one thing which is keeping you excited, or, or one project which you're looking forward to. So, so both the objectives that I talked of that we are pursuing, yeah. you know, connected products and connected operations, right? This yeah. is something that we want to kind of take it to conclusion and continue to, you know, be on this journey. We just started up on that. And I think the, the larger uh, piece of the pie which is on the table is that when you talk of not China plus one, but the India strategy Correct. is that I think now a lot of demand is coming our way, right? Sure. I know in my headquarter, at least there are three inquiries every day basis where people just want the capacity at any cost, mm. right? Now, how do we kind of create that capacity at that pace? Uh, and that is, I would say, for the larger forum here is that how do we now, it is like, it's like lottery to be kind of unleashed. How do we, you know, get this out? Uh, because the demand is going to be immense. Uh, the capacities that have gone out of the world because of geopolitical uh, reasons are immense. Uh, and people are looking at India. Now, can we, how do we make sure that the businessman feels comfortable in enhancing that capacity because today I think what they are still toying with the idea is that 
you know, if you, I, if I put it up for you and tomorrow you go away, then what do I do with that capacity, Correct. right? Now, how do you make sure that it's a sustainable capacity? Correct. Or, you know, if something we can do at a country level to say that, you know, there is something that we, we are there to support them. Great. Uh, and connected products and connected operations in both these things, make sure that you do the right decisioning in real time. Correct. Right? Yeah. Then if I put that capacity in, I'm able to juice it out to the best. Uh, and definitely, you know, have my parameters and my financial parameters in control. Good. Thank you so much for that, Mridul. I'm going to now open it up for the audience. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I would only request, I hope uh, mics can be reached to, if uh, there is a gentleman over there, middle towards the back, uh, we'll go with you, sir, first. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, my name is Amanesh Chakravarti. I'm from IISC Bangalore. I heard the CFC Smart Factory uh, that Samar Twitter has uh, funded. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, I'm absolutely excited for all the points that you have brought in, and I'm very much in line with that. However, I have a number of other points that I have been experiencing as we have gone through this Industry 4.0 training, research, innovation journey at IIC. Sure. And I'll just share some of them. First of all, I would like to mention that analytics is not just data science. Okay, it's far more uh, complicated than data science. It's a marriage of engineering science and data science. For example, the machines don't fail very often these days. So you're not going to get the tons of failure data. There are very little failure data. Question is not how do you do big data analytics, how do you do sparse data analytics? Okay, that's, that's a, that's a I, I, I would like to comment on that, but let me just make the points first. Yeah. The second is that you know, each solution that we today produce, they're all specific solutions. They don't have very little reuse value. We can't simply take it and use it elsewhere. I create an analytics, for example, preventive maintenance solution for a lathe. I can't transfer it to grinder, right? So that's another question. How do you increase the reuse value? Because then the cost comes down because you can apply it elsewhere. Point number three, you know, you are, if you are going to put in more sensors, which is generally the idea of industry 4.0, and then you are going to get tons of data. You've already mentioned that you are going to increase the sustainability issue even further because you are increasing the amount of materials, variety of them, what happens to the end of life, amount of energy consumed, both in storage and analytics, as well as the sensors being produced. So it's a major potential issue for sustainability. The next point is that most MSMEs are hand in mouth. Our six crore MSMEs out of that 90% have less than 10 people. And it, it is shown by OECD countries report that when, as you increase the size of the company, your ability to innovate and train your people, et cetera, increases. So in other words, they're not capable of doing that, which means that we really need very affordable uh, solutions for the MSMEs. And I would like to hear from you, what are those incredibly, I will say 10x products, 10 times cheaper, uh, providing the same, same kind of function. Correct. How do we get that for the MSMEs? It's not just using cloud and producing some particular solution. Last point, in robotics, you know, we talk about a lot of benefits, but one issue is, again, it's very specific. Every time you have to create a separate jig and fixture in order to get one particular function done, how do you create non-jig, non-fixture solutions where I can very easily, using digitalization, transfer one robotic, uh, the same robotic assembly to do very different assembly. So those are some of the points. Last point is that this is about jobs. Jobs is still a real issue, okay, because what is happening right now is that the companies are saying, we are not going to lose jobs, we are going to retrain them, they will do more than they could do before with automation. But the growth is not there. You are not increasing the number of jobs in the same rate as before. Now, if you want to increase that, which means that your demand has to increase. So how do you dramatically change the demand such that your job growth can also align with industry? So those are the points on which I would like you to comment. Thank you. Sure. I was thinking, Professor Chakravarti, as you were talking, I should have probably brought in that question at the start of the panel. Um, but uh, I, th I think what you spoke about clearly underscores the complexity of the challenge. When you're talking about all of these challenges and we're talking about country, the scale of India in manufacturing for all of India to be raised to the next level, leveraging new technologies, leveraging all of the change management, uh, you have to address each one of these things that you've spoken about. I don't think time permits us to explore every dimension that you asked, but I'm going to touch upon two. Uh, you know, you spoke about MSMEs and affordability. That was an area that we briefly tried to explore, right? But 
one of the things which MSMEs can really be benefited, can benefit from, and Sabir, you did touch upon that, is the manner in which the COEs that have been brought about, all eight of these COEs, right? Uh, so they are one of them, of course, right? Certainly. I think the role of, because you, if you're trying to raise the game of an entire nation and a sector as large and complex as manufacturing, the entire ecosystems have to evolve. Uh, it is easier said than done, and it is not something where you can move a magic wand. Maybe what I can do in response to your question is one sentence to each one of my panelists on an idea so that, I'll, yeah. I'll the, on the first one, right, yeah. see how do you kind of create something which is affordable for MSMEs, yeah. right? I, I would say today, see, uh, across various MSME, and take the example of GST, right? Yeah. GST today needs some software and yeah. stuff. Now, if you have to do something which has to be created by everybody or they have to depend on a local professional, it will cost money and yeah. they have suffered in some cases in that. But today, if, you know, GST and also brought in certain cloud softwares, they bundled it along and they gave it out saying that, you know, you, you can use it, it will do most of your stuff on its own. Now, if that thing comes to, you know, MSME at say 600 rupees a month, which is affordable. <laughs> the, the training is available online, yeah. which means that to learn that software, maybe I've got tutorials, I've got videos and stuff, yeah. which they can do self-learning. Yeah. Then what happens is that you are bridging a basic gap saying that there is a software which is available. Yeah. Software is cheap for you to use. It is already created and some of, you know, for example, I know C4I4 Labs has created a bundle of those products Correct. across production planning, logistics, Correct. manufacture, all, so, and it is available for them to just subscribe to and take it, right, Correct. at a very affordable cost. Correct. Then you first come to the first stepping stone that you go into the first stage of automation, which is automating your processes. Correct. Then I think then their mind opens up to what next, but I would say this is my simple recipe saying that if something is available and cloud is definitely an enabler there, at a very affordable rate, Correct. has been created for you, training is available, you at least step so, into the so, next. So providing the infrastructure, making it yeah. affordable, yeah. And, and making it scalable, yeah. Yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, any, other, uh, any other questions? The gentleman over there at the back, please, if you can have a mic. Am I audible? Sure. Yeah, I'm Sachin Arora, uh, representing Textile Machinery Manufacturers Association from Bombay. Um, it's worth very uh, illuminating and encouraging to hear the panelists. Uh, just to add on to uh, the other uh, uh, person who asked the question about uh, this MSMEs, I would like to ask you where do we factor in uh, our supply chain when it is coming to uh, you know, our farming community? Because we belong to textile and textile engineering industry. Also from the food processing and pulp and paper industry. How do we factor in industry 4.0 from uh, that aspect, because uh, if we talk about the land holding, uh, the weather forecasting, the vagaries of the weather patterns, how do we factor in the industry 4.0? Th Thank thanks, you. Mr. Arora. I think uh, you're talking about the holistic nature of the, the impact, and I have someone mm. who's, who's uniquely qualified to address that, so that question is meant for you, Ravindra. No, I think, you know, I, I just want to bundle up the answer again to, sir, yourself and to you, that, you know, basically, uh, the whole discussion is about how do we make things sustainable. So we have to make a conscious choice for going low carbon materials, low carbon fuels. For instance, we don't see plastic water bottles here. Yeah. Saying no to, uh, you know, uh, carbon cycles which run in hundreds of years. So I think that is that was a quick response to him. Now, you're right that, uh, you know, uh, how do we make the whole industry 4.0? That's a... That's a th possibilities are infinite to actually have applications in an area that you describe right from knowing the crop patterns, right from knowing the weather conditions, right from knowing the harvesting times, uh, feedstock management, processing time, and then further uptime. So it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, I, only thing I can say is opportunities are unlimited. Indeed, the issue is whether the cost benefit works in your favor or no. So, that's where I think the earlier discussion was about knowing the life cycle analysis and probably cost of ownership. That, that would help us make a business case and probably we'll be able to uh, make some, some strong uh, financial arguments for fitting in 4.0. Sure.
Thank, thank you for that, Ravindra. Gentleman here. I'm an MSME manufacturing uh, some hydraulic products and uh, <coughs> in touch with a lot of MSMEs. In new scenario of uh, Industry 4.0 implementation, there is a threat that MSME is going to badly affected because capability is not there. And uh, before we build the capability, import will take over the entire market. If we wanted to have some good solutions, uh, why we cannot have, uh, you know, with MSME, we have very big problem with the uh, demand and supply data. So with the data analysis system, before analyzing my small machine or my small factory, it can help me to have data analysis of demand and supply. Because when I'm, uh, I'm, if I'm manufacturing one product and enlarging my manufacturing capacity, tomorrow I will see that one MNC has came into the market and they have taken over my entire product with a very big production capacity and I am no more as an existence. To keep this existence with MSME, because MSME is a backbone and more than 70% are the supporting industry to big industry. If we have a data analysis for demand and supply only for our country, then the MSME can uh, catch something out of that. Uh, suppose there is a share exchange. If I wanted to buy some shares, information is available. Similarly, my product is available as, as, as on exchange. I can book some product on that and supply to that company. So that's that type of data analysis may help my country to sustain as a manufacturer. Otherwise, we will become a trader. I think you're thinking about it the right way because you're not only thinking about your today's business, but you want to really figure out how are the trends going to evolve and you want to have those insights. I think you're thinking about it, sir, the right way because decision making has to be fact based and you're seeking those facts out. I don't know if anyone on the panel no, has. I think uh, there is, there is yeah. no quick answer to yeah. this, yeah. but I think uh, the whole game of CapEx investment in Industry 4.0 for MSAB can be done in a collaborative way. So you get some like-minded people to come together and invest, or people who are across the value chain come and invest, or people like C4, so I think, C4, I4, so I think the whole game is that of collaboration as far as MSME is concerned. Yeah. On a standalone basis, they're gonna find it very hard yeah. to finance uh, the whole intervention, yeah. to attract talent who can manage that intervention and keep upgrading. So it has to be a collaborative game. So I'll just it's add it's one point to it is that see, uh, what I see is that when we do industry 4.0, uh, when we look at the overall impact on the society and ESG standpoint also, it moves the concept of when we also say, you know, go vocal for local. Because to decrease the environmental impact, the production has to get distributed closer to the consumption points. Correct. Right? And MSMEs are the vehicles for that, Correct. saying that, you know, tomorrow we cannot be sustainable in case the production is happening in one place in the world and it is getting exported all over the place. Correct. So I think that is where I see that when you get integrated into those systems, yes. those, like today I would say, you know, if you take the example of an Uber driver, he gets the demand supply on his mobile phone and the, it is available and they are able to service and his life is much easier. When tomorrow MSMEs get integrated into the industry 4.0 systems, those demands may automatically come to you based on the local demand that it gets channeled and also the, you know, the, the manufacturer or other, you know, parties that you're supplying to you that they get directly connected to you, which is a machine to machine talk and where you get an exact idea of how much supply I need to make tomorrow, day after in four hours and you can actually manage your capacities likely. So I do feel that it may not be just a, you know, a very big threat from a MSME standpoint. I believe if it is done right, it actually can distribute the production across various. No, I think that's a, that's a great insight, Mridul. And I know that there are a lot of questions there in the audience, but unfortunately, we've reached the end of uh, time for this. And I know we have, sorry, uh, and and I know that uh, we have the lunch break just, available. Yeah. Just sorry. a minute. Uh, I want to give one answer, answer regarding questions of MSME. I'm sorry, I, I can't. Prakash Mittal, National President Lagu Uttog Bharti. Government of India's scheme of DOP, this one district, one product, ODOP, and the cluster-based development for the MSME is the right way for the industrial growth of 4.0. Cluster-based development. 
जहां इंडस्ट्रीज का एक क्लस्टर डेवलप हो सकता है उसके द्वारा एमएसएमई का ग्रोथ होगा और वही एमएसएमई सस्टेनेबल करेगा और इंडस्ट्रियल 4.0 इसके लिए सबसे बेस्ट सॉल्यूशन है भारत सरकार ने वन डिस्ट्रिक्ट वन प्रोडक्ट उत्तर प्रदेश सरकार ने निर्माण किया है तो जहां पे जिस डिस्ट्रिक्ट के अंदर जहां पे वन प्रोडक्ट के ऊपर अपन डेवलप कर सकते हैं वो क्लस्टर बेस्ड डेवलपमेंट और वन डिस्ट्रिक्ट वन प्रोडक्ट को ही हम सस्टेनेबल आगे बढ़ा सकते हैं दैट विल बी द राइट आंसर for your question very very beautiful report uh, sir and thanks for bringing in that perspective odop is is uh, is a great uh, best practice and clusters have uh, really proven to be very successful particularly in the automotive industry great example so like all good things this this panel discussion also has to come to an end uh, i want to take this opportunity to thank each one of my panelists uh, you made yourselves available for uh, multiple different dimensions to be uh, brought to the fore so thank you so much for that uh, industry 4.0 it it has several possibilities around it but it is also possible for us to make small beginnings and scale up from over there it is very very critical that we treat it as a large change management undertaking we should anticipate that there would be you need to carry your stakeholders around you heard the discussion uh, discussions around participative nature so you have to engage various stakeholders who are otherwise likely to see that as a threat but you need to make them as a part of a solution rather than leave them as a part of the problem right but at the same time the pace at which technology is emerging you can treat that as a superpower that's available to you which will allow you to burst the complexity that exists around us on that note uh, i want to thank everyone and particularly the audience for being so engaging and so patient uh, and i'm sure that uh, the dialogues will continue over lunch thanks a lot bahut bahut dhanyawad mahoday और ये बहुत ही गहन चर्चा मैं एक बार फिर सारे पैनलिस्ट का हृदय से धन्यवाद करना चाहूँगी कि यहाँ इंडस्ट्री 4.0 के कार्यान्वयन के लिए नए सुझाव नए विचार हमारे सामने इन्होंने रखे आप सब से अनुरोध है कि एक बार ज़ोरदार तालियाँ हमारे पैनलिस्ट के लिए और अब मैं माननीय सचिव श्री अरुण गोयल जी भारी उद्योग भारत सरकार से निवेदन करती हूँ कि हमारे पैनलिस्ट के सम्मान के लिए एक स्मृति चिन्ह उन्हें देकर सम्मानित करें सबसे पहले इस पैनल को इस पैनल डिस्कशन को मॉडरेट कर रहे श्री दिलीप साहनी जी मैनेजिंग डायरेक्टर रॉकवेल ऑटोमेशन इंडिया प्राइवेट लिमिटेड हमारे माननीय सचिव भारी उद्योग मंत्रालय श्री अरुण गोयल जी श्री दिलीप साहनी जी को स्मृति चिन्ह देते हुए श्री समीर प्रकाश जनरल मैनेजर एंड हेड ऑफ डिजिटल एंटरप्राइज डिवीजन डिजिटल इंडस्ट्री सीमेंस इंडिया सर आपके लिए ये स्मृति चिन्ह हमारे इस इंडस्ट्री 4.0 के सम्मेलन की तरफ से श्री मृदुल शर्मा एग्जीक्यूटिव वाइस प्रेसिडेंट एंड चीफ डिजिटल ऑफिसर किरलॉस्कर ग्रुप श्री संदीप गोयल सीनियर वाइस प्रेसिडेंट हैवी फोर्ज डिवीजन भारत फोर्ज डॉक्टर रविंद्र उदगीकर वाइस प्रेसिडेंट कॉपोरेट स्ट्रैटेजी एंड मार्केटिंग प्राज इंडस्ट्रीज आप सबका बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद और धन्यवाद माननीय सचिव जी का और अब भोजन का समय हो चला है तो मैं आप सब से अनुरोध करती हूं कि कृपया डाइनिंग हॉल की तरफ प्रस्थान करें भोजन ग्रहण करें और हम दो बजे अगली पैनल डिस्कशन के लिए फिर से कॉन्फ्रेंस हॉल में मिलेंगे धन्यवाद
chick 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 holly holly chick holly holly chick holly holly chick chick holly holly chick chick holly holly holly
हमारी अगली पैनल डिस्कशन का विषय है इंडस्ट्री 4.0 पॉइंट जीरो इन ऑटो इंडस्ट्रीज कि हम समझते हैं कि भोजन के उपरांत इस तरह की चर्चाएं और पैनल डिस्कशंस कुछ कष्टपूर्ण हो सकती हैं किंतु जो विषय है हमारे अगली पैनल डिस्कशन का वो निश्चित तौर पर बहुत ही आकर्षक है और क्योंकि सब लोग गाड़ियां चलाते हैं गाड़ियों में इंटरेस्ट रखते हैं तो ऐसा विषय है जो हम सबकी हम सबके जीवन को छूता है उम्मीद करते हैं आप इस डिस्कशन में पूर्ण तौर पर भाग लेंगे तो हमारी अगली पैनल डिस्कशन के लिए मैं आमंत्रित करती हूं श्री कवन मुख्तियार पार्टनर मैनेजिंग मैनेजमेंट कंसल्टिंग ऑटोमोटिव सेक्टर लीडर पीडब्ल्यूसी इंडिया को श्री कवन मुख्तियार हमारी इस पैनल डिस्कशन को मॉडरेट करेंगे इसका संचालन करेंगे और इस डिस्कशन में जो प्रतिभागी हैं जो हमारे दूसरे पैनलिस्ट हैं श्री विनोद अग्रवाल प्रेसिडेंट एस आई ए एम एंड एम डी एंड सी ई ओ वॉल्वो आयशर कमर्शियल व्हीकल्स लिमिटेड तालियों के साथ स्वागत श्री विनोद अग्रवाल जी का श्री शैलेश चंद्रा वाइस प्रेसिडेंट एस आई ए एम एंड मैनेजिंग डायरेक्टर टाटा मोटर्स पैसेंजर व्हीकल लिमिटेड एंड टाटा इलेक्ट्रिक मोबिलिटी लिमिटेड टाटा मोटर्स मैं श्री शैलेश चंद्र चंद्रा जी को मंच पर आमंत्रित करती हूँ और श्री एरिक वास प्रेसिडेंट बजाज ऑटो महोदय आप सबका स्वागत है हमारी अगली पैनल डिस्कशन के लिए और अब मैं मंच सौंपना चाहूँगी श्री कवन मुख्तियार जी को जो इस इंडस्ट्री 4.0 पॉइंट ज़ीरो इन ऑटो इंडस्ट्रीज डिस्कशन को मॉडरेट करेंगे श्री कवन मुख्तियार जी A very good afternoon to you all, and uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to the ministry, Mr. Arun Goel, all the dignitaries. Thank you for inviting me to be part of this very august panel. Um, auto industry is going through a fantastic transformation. A lot of new things are happening around us, and Industry 4.0 is certainly, you know, one of the key elements of the change. So I'm going to talk a little bit about. from a price water of scoopers standpoint when we look at industry 4.0 in the automotive industry context uh, why really is this big change happening what are the drivers for that change what are some of the challenges that we are facing as we embark on this journey and i believe that uh, my opening remarks will really set a good stage for you know sharing sessions uh, from the industry perspective so first and foremost uh, what is those big changes happening from a customer standpoint you know the automotive industry is highly competitive as we know and uh, to compete and win market share auto oems have to offer more value to the customer better customer experience a broader range of products and as they do that you know the complexity in the business is only going to go up dramatically I remember 10 years back when I went in the market to buy a car uh, I probably had like for every model I had three or four variants I just bought a car a uh, few months ago and this time every model had at least 10 to 12 variants and similarly the same story in two wheelers as well as in trucks the whole trend towards personalization of vehicles is picking up speed and what that does is auto oems as well as the component supply chain has to deal with lot of different variety of products that are getting manufactured and that adds lot of new complexities so to deal with that and 
at the same time, you know, the margins are always under pressure. We know auto industry is one of the most efficient industries. To do that effectively, you want to address variety, but at a very cost-effective point. And that's where the need of visibility and digital or Industry 4.0 comes in. If you have done Industry 4.0 deployment, with the same line, you can have so much versatility trying to make different uh, products, different variants. Um, you know, For the same capital investment, you can actually unlock more value. So that's one major driver. The other key driver that we see is the cost of technology is coming down dramatically. In the past 10 years back, if you want to do a massive uh, you know, industry 4.0 or equivalent investment in its earlier avatar, you would have to set up big data center in your facility, you know, set up big servers, et cetera. But now a lot of it is available in the cloud. The cost of sensors, the hardware, the you know, automation products, PLCs, is also dramatically coming down. So getting access to the most advanced technology is happening at a more cost-effective level. The other big change, and I think you know, with the coming of 5G and um, you know, deeper uh, availability of connectivity, even in remote parts of the country, is making you know, Industry 4.0 deployments a lot more reliable. So these are one, some of the key factors that is driving auto industry to move towards Industry 4.0. But has it really happened at scale? At least my assessment as an industry consultant is that yes, there is lots of experimentation that has happened, a lot of POCs, pilots that have happened, but it is yet to happen at scale. We are probably in phase one of the whole deployment of uh, Industry 4.0. And uh, what are some of the challenges that we are facing and what's the road ahead? Um, while you know there is a lot of value that Industry 4.0 can unlock, I think the whole industry is in co consensus on that point, but there are some roadblocks. Uh, first and foremost, in my opinion, is mindset. You know, mindset from the CEO's office all the way to the shop floor, right? Adapting new technology is not easy. You know, you have to embrace, understand what benefit it will give you. One of the biggest challenges, in many instances, the ROIs are not very clear. What is the return on the investment that I'm going to make? But the question which comes up is, what is the return that you get uh, if you uh, have a flexible manufacturing capability? It's hard to quantify at times. So that's one of the big challenge. The other, you know, related to mindset. You know, I was in Germany a few months ago, and I was talking to my colleagues in Germany in, uh, who were involved in Industry 4.0 deployment. And uh, they were telling me that, you know, from the outside, it seems like we are at the cutting edge. But internally, we also struggle to convince our workers' councils uh, when we are doing Industry 4.0 implementation. So how do you address the human element of this big change? How do you manage this change is another uh, huge issue. The third point that, you know, I see as uh, some of the challenges is where is the skill available? When you do Industry 4.0 deployment, we talked about, the earlier panel talked about advanced data analytics capabilities. The talent pool, even in a country like India, where we have so many engineers, is still at a nascent stage. And what's the right approach? Does it make sense for us to you know, train our existing teams, or does it make sense to get talent from outside? And maybe the answer is you know, a, a hybrid of the two. These and many such questions are getting addressed. But one thing is for sure, that across the board, auto industry, auto component industry is investing big time on uh, digital transformation and in Industry 4.0, because eventually the, the, the vision is to be con having a connected supply chain all the way from the customers back to your end suppliers. And as I see right now, we are building, uh, investing in a lot of the building blocks and there are some use cases that are really picking up momentum, like for example, in energy management, uh, predictive maintenance, uh, workforce management, uh, measuring and visualizing on your OEE. So some of the use cases are very clear out there. But uh, you know, really, this is just the beginning, and I think our journey forward, especially in the next five years, is gonna help India build competitiveness in manufacturing if we embrace 
industry 4.0 full heartedly so that uh, is what i wanted to share as the environment in which we are really operating uh, let me now begin uh, by inviting mr vinod agarwal mr vinod agarwal is the president of siam md and ceo of ecv and he's been in this uh, role for many years and he's seen the industry transform so mr agarwal we would love to hear your views on what the industry is going through and how we are embracing industry 4.0 over to you sir yeah mr agarwal will use the podium please thank you kavin and uh, my fellow panelists and of course uh, we have our very very dynamic secretary arun goel ji and both the joint secretaries and uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen it's always difficult uh, after lunch but let's let's see how we can make it more interesting uh, uh, i think uh, first of all uh, uh, the ministry of heavy industry uh, uh, having organized this uh, this conference on the industry 4.0 Uh, that needs a lot of compliments, and uh, it's absolutely need of the uh, current time. And uh, and of course, if we have to grow the economy during the Samrat Kal uh, period, uh, definitely this is the this is the right area for our deliberations. And uh, and as part of Industry 4.0, manufacturing is an important pillar. So therefore, uh, the topic of uh, today's uh, panel discussion, the smart manufacturing. it's absolutely very very relevant and uh, and of course from siam uh, we have been working on this uh, very very actively and we have uh, held various uh, awareness uh, uh, workshops uh, from siam on this and we have also held lot of deliberations with our suppliers tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 regularly so that industry 4.0 ensures seamless uh, connection of physical and uh, Uh, digital domains uh, through various appro uh, approaches of course uh, we all know that uh, uh, the things that we have to do uh, under this uh, like for example uh, internet of things iot's or advanced robotics or cloud computing or big data analytics augmented reality uh, simulations horizontal vertical integration cyber security the whole lot of things and of course we are going to uh, discuss today Uh, in this panel uh, some of the live examples from uh, these uh, technology new new areas uh, and of course uh, it's uh, these technologies are paving the way uh, uh, to a future in which the smart factories smart machines and network processes are carried out together to boost output productivity flexibility and increase profitability and giant strides are made over the past decade in information and communication technology uh, uh, and of course they have radically reshaped and uh, we have got into the learning uh, environment industrial revolution 4.0 is upon us absolutely very much there ushering in disruptive technologies that have been rapidly changing our personal and professional space and business models and uh, of course i would like to highlight three key areas which will see major transformation first is on the skill sets uh, in the changing scenario traditional engineering practices are undergoing a radical transformation which is changing the way we work it is mandatory to possess the new skill sets and devise novel ways of learning understanding and adopting new technologies as kavin rightly said it's the uh, question of mindset and we have to uh, definitely uh, redeploy we have to retrain reskill ourselves so that you know we are ready to adopt to the new practices uh, second is on the supply chains uh, industry 4.0 portrays technological advances and disruptive development in the industrial sector and affects the way the supply chains are managed tier 1 tier 2 suppliers need to orient their businesses and the processes to align with the schedule of oems for the on time deliveries through seamless connectivity of the processes of supply chain and this can be achieved only through connectivity with sensors and software and amongst various devices and machines in the value chain for for transition to industry 
And third is the manufacturing processes. The market or the consumer requirements would get captured on a real-time basis. Uh, that would enable the manufacturing schedules of the companies to align completely with the demand. Uh, today, the market demands large number of variants of a single model from every manufacturer. This technology will enable manufacturers to have a completely flexible manufacturing processes to cater to a very dynamic market requirement. Uh, and then, of course, as the companies look at the global expansion of their markets, the operating systems gradually become more complex and Industry 4.0 permits the entire value chain of the organizations with the new business models. So in order to achieve the above, Industry 4.0 brings in end-to-end -end digitalization and integration of existing physical assets uh, in system and networks, uh, networks them to a series of technologies to create value in the companies. The Indian auto industry is recognized as sunrise industry and is one of the fastest growing sectors in India. India is now the fourth largest car manufacturer, fourth largest heavy commercial vehicles manufacturer, second largest manufacturer of two wheelers in the world. So therefore, uh, but of course, uh, these are the number terms. In value terms, we are still very small. So there is huge uh, opportunity and huge change that is going to happen. And as we move forward, uh, toward the futuristic technological space, the auto industry will be at the forefront of the technology and will bring the world-class products to you. And uh, I think that, uh, let's, uh, let's carry forward this discussion. Thank you, Mr. Agarwal. Let me now invite uh, Shailesh Chandra, uh, VP of Siam, Managing Director of Tata Motors Passenger Vehicle and Electric Mobility Business. Shailesh, your opening remarks, please. Thanks, you. Thanks, Kavan. And uh, I think your starting remarks uh, pretty much uh, uh, detailed out the opportunities as well as challenges that uh, are there as far as Industry 4.0 adoption is concerned. But let me start by saying that, you know, one, that it is destined that India is going to be among the top five economies. And uh, if that is to be true, there's a bigger role of manufacturing industry uh, in this whole economic growth journey of the nation. And when you talk about manufacturing sector, I think uh, Indian auto industry is uh, going to play a big role given that it nearly contributes to 35% of uh, the manufacturing GDP. Now from a government perspective, if you also see uh, the government has been, uh, has clearly laid down the vision of make in India, Atmanirbhar Bharat and very much supported with uh, you know progressive policies like PLI to, en to ensure that you know the advanced technologies and their manufacturing is coming to India and we don't miss the bus as we had been missing the bus in the earlier uh, times. So I think given this, I think it is imperative on the Indian auto industry that we start adopting manufacturing systems and processes uh, and across the value chain uh, go for uh, exploiting the benefits that uh, uh, digital technologies and the advent that we are seeing in the you know information and communicant communication technologies fully exploited to the advantage and I think uh, industry 4.0 is providing us the right framework and uh, more so I would say set of technology toolkits you know whether we talk about IOT we talked about AI ML AR VR digital twins to be exploited I think if we are able to really leverage upon these technologies, it is going to do two things. And it's important to understand this because one, on one hand, it will lead us to enhance our quality, which will be world-class. Productivity is a clear benefit that we get and equipment availability. I think these three are the cost side. But there is opportunity on the revenue side which is not understood. Because what it does is that it connects the entire value chain. You work in a you know, digital ecosystem, which is connecting in and it letting the information flow across the value chain, right from the demand side to the supply side. And therefore, the agility and responsiveness that you bring has a value. And it is a top line driver and that we need to understand. And when you see in combination the two, this is going to offer tremendous benefit 
uh, not only for the nation but for individual companies and this is the realization which you touched upon the mindset i think mindset right now is more that you are only going to do certain things on the cost side and therefore ROI is not understood. If you combine that with the top line benefit that you're going to get, all of a sudden the equation completely changes. So I think this is one important thing. You rightly mentioned right time to exploit this because four years back, five years back, this would still be a good discussion. But right now the costs are coming down to an extent that now it is becoming a reality uh, ready to be exploited. So I think therefore it is imperative that uh, the industry, Indian auto industry, starts moving towards it. I think auto OEMs will have to play a big role. There will be challenges. And I think those challenges have to be first understood properly. I think recently, Siam and ACMA had uh, conducted a joint study. And uh, it was conducted to focus on coming with a transformative roadmap you know, for adoption of digital technologies uh, in auto industry. But they also brought forth you know, a lot of observation that uh, while uh, people are uh, talking all positive about Industry 4.0, but this absence of a transformation strategy, for example, or uh, putting you know the people structure in place to support that, I think while OEMs, there is a series of initiatives that are being taken, but on the supply side, it's absolutely nascent, uh, non-existent, if I may use that word. Uh, you're seeing more initiatives, more on the sales and marketing side, but less on the other parts of the value chain. Uh, so these are the challenges that got observed, but I think you know the outcome which came out is that for different part of the value chain where we are and what should be the end state, that gap has been identified and we have to move you know, as a consortium, as a group, and collaborate to really address this issue because everybody has the same set of issues. Here there's no competition. Here is only the benefit coming out of collaboration and that is what we need to understand. I think in this direction, the support which MHI has given through starting initiatives like Samarth Udyog 4.0 is a good move to create this awareness, show demonstration, uh, and uh, make people aware of how you can go and adopt Industry 4.0 because you rightly said, it's very fuzzy. You know what this animal is and understand every element of this is important. And therefore, this initiative is one on one side helping the SMEs, but it is also good for auto OEMs because we have been sending, for example, in C4I for our people to get more uh, aware of uh, these technologies because your second line leaders is where the you know the mindsets uh, you know start because you're not familiar, your familiarity is not there. So I think those things we'll have to work on. Very, uh, we'll have to work as a collaboration with government, with academia, us, and therefore we have to embark on this journey with confidence and with clear deliverables understood. You know, ROI has to be understood. It starts at the leadership level, then you start preparing your workforce, and we have to go through that journey. And that journey has to be done through collaboration. I think the time is right. There are big opportunities to be exploited, both on the top line side, responsiveness side, customer experience side, but there are challenges of skill set that needs to be addressed and mindsets, as you said. That would be my initial remarks. Thank you, thank you, Shailesh. So let's move to Eric. Uh, Eric, of course, is president of uh, Bajaj Auto. So your initial thoughts, please. Uh, thank you, Kavan. Uh, before I give my thoughts, I thought it's post-lunch, can I do a quick poll? How many in this room, please put up your hand to the question. How many in this room believe that Industry 4.0 is driven by consumers? A show of hands. Very few hands, more hands. How many believe that it is driven by industry? 50-50. Okay, so, you know, let me, let me give the Bajaj perspective. Uh, we believe very strongly that Industry 4.0 is actually going to be driven by consumers. And the reason I'm saying this is, if you look at India today, and we ask ourselves a question, are our consumers digitally enabled? The answer is a very large number of consumers are digitally enabled. People have smartphones, they use Flipkart, they use Amazon, they search for prices on Google, they are digitally enabled. My contention is that when a consumer is digitally enabled, we as suppliers of products and services don't have a choice. We have to be able to serve these consumers. 
So the question is, what is different about serving this consumer than from the traditional channel? And why is Industry 4.0 so important? Because it's important to understand what leads us to Industry 4.0. I believe it's an outside-in framework. The moment the consumer is digitally enabled, you can capture details of the consumer, you know exactly what he wants, and you need to be able to supply him exactly, and you need to transfer that information, as my colleagues Silesh and uh, Vinod have mentioned, right through the supply chain. But this is not the way we are used to working. The way industry is used to working is very, very different. Uh, someone captures sales information that is actually never shared organizationally within the OEM with the manufacturing guys. The manufacturing guys just get a list, make this color, this quantity, this, this quantity. There is no data that says this customer is waiting for 10 days, this customer is waiting for two days. So I think the great mental mind shift that has to change for us is firstly we have to understand that data driven by consumer and of course other kinds of data also has to be made transparently available across the organization and that's where we have our first problem in transformation in Bajaj Auto. We've, we've learned that it's not so easy to make data transparent and the stumbling block starts with data transparency. Technology I think is a lesser issue, it costs money but technology exists, you can fix it. The second problem is we have invested significantly already, like everyone in this room who's in the manufacturing sector, we've invested significantly in certain hardwares and softwares. Legacy investments, as we like to call them. Suddenly, we now have to transform this because the old legacy systems simply don't work in industry 4.0. Uh, transition costs money, but I think if we start measuring ROI, we are catching the wrong end of the horse. If your consumer is transforming, I don't think ROI matters, it's a question of survival. So when a transformation of this nature takes place, no one asked what is the ROI of transferring from steam to electric power. If we didn't take electric in place of steam, he'd be out of business. I think we are undergoing a similar shift in our paradigm in manufacturing. And we need to find creative solutions. I think during the discussion, it, it would be important for us you know, sometimes to put cost on the side and just ask ourselves, how do we fix the problem? And, and I think that there are a lot of solutions out there that allow us to fix the problem. And uh, as OEMs uh, and as large industries, we would need to play a significant role in this transformation. I'll just leave you with a perspective, uh, which I think is useful sometimes to think about uh, from our side, uh, what we in Bajaj think. Uh, we know industry 4.0 is a transformation which involves primarily digital technologies, uh, coupled with the industrial internet of things. Uh, but if you look at transformation, and we look back at successful Indian examples of transformation, and I'm saying this deliberately, uh, and we look at how transformation has happened in other sectors in the country, I think we need to take a stage gate approach towards uh, industry 4.0. I mean, today when we see the way uh, RBI works or payment gateways work and payment system works, we have to remember this transformation started with RTGS many, many years ago. And today you're seeing a UPI. I think we have to plan our transformation accordingly and it probably needs a lot of intervention at various levels to make things work. Thank you. Thanks, thanks. I think the analogy of, how, of the payment gateways and how they've transformed is really good. So let me uh, come um, back to Mr. Agarwal. I mean, you in your opening remarks, you did say that uh, now is the right time, yeah? Uh, so I would like to pick this a little bit, peel the onion a little bit and go deeper into it. And why do we believe this is the right time? And uh, maybe if you can give some examples from what you've seen in the industry as well on how you see this playing out. Absolutely. Uh, I think uh, I will pick up your first point when you mentioned about the whole thing coming from the customer side. <clears throat> I think customer is today becoming more and more impatient. Uh, he wants the best of choice when it comes to the products. He wants the, the product without any defect. He wants the service to happen <clears throat> seamlessly. He wants if the vehicle is down, then it should immediately get addressed. <clears throat> Therefore, unless the organizations 
prepare themselves to address these needs, uh, they will be left behind. So therefore, if you have to remain in this current competitive world, then you have to see that how to address the uh, customer needs. Now, it's all about data. Whenever a truck is running or car is running or any vehicle is running, there is huge data that is being generated <coughs> through the engine. That data earlier was not used. But now, in the current system of things, that entire that data can be leveraged. The companies have started leveraging that data. Uh, that data which gets generated through the engine when it is running, uh, there are issues, there are a lot of ele advanced electronic uh, things, uh, which can uh, transmit that data on a real-time basis uh, to your control centers. And based on your analytics, uh, which are there, uh, artificial intelligence and uh, all the data analytics, uh, then you can predict based on the how the behavior of the vehicle is going to be. Uh, and it is already happening. It's, we have started doing it in Volvo Aisher. Uh, for example, uh, we give connected uh, trucks. And when those trucks are running on the roads, uh, the entire data keeps on coming to us in our control center. And suppose there is engine is overheating or if there is uh, something wrong with the engine, we are able to predict it. We are able to know it on real-time basis in our control center. And a call goes to the uh, driver that uh, you are on so and you are at so and so place, and this is uh, going to go wrong. If it is a very serious issue, we can advise him to just stay there, and the service van will come and address it, or we book him to the next uh, workshop. Uh, similarly, this data is being used um, in the uh, shop floor, uh, predictive maintenance. Now, the earlier uh, machines were going under breakdown, and then, of course, the lines used to get stopped. But nowadays, you can't afford that. Uh, if you stop your lines, if you are not able to produce, of course, it will mean major loss of your productivity. Uh, now, you are able to predict it. Suppose there is vibration happening on the machines. There are sensors which are there. They are able to predict that uh, now this is going beyond a particular limit. This machine will come under breakdown, or it will not produce quality. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you can take the action proactively. Similarly, safety system. If earlier uh, fire uh, used to happen uh, and your spinnacle system was not working or of your fire hydrants were not working, now there are sensors. You are able to see it absolutely before time. If there is anything is wrong, you know it very well in advance, and uh, the things are always remain. So therefore, the predictability. Similarly, if there are any defects which are there, in the field, you can trace that defect back to the uh, uh, to the actual, um, you know, date and time and uh, which person was working on the line and who was the supplier. You can trace it back. Genealogy is so strong now that you can trace it back. This is all possible because you have uh, using this IOTs now or data analytics or machine learning. I think these are the things which are absolutely now started happening. And, uh, and unless we do it, we will not be able to keep the customers with us. Excellent point, sir. So in some ways, Industry 4.0, it's not just about manufacturing. It's about a connected value chain, you know, all the way from customer to manufacturing to suppliers. Manufacturing is just one part of it. End of the day, it has to. Everything has to be connected to the customer. I think all needs flow from the customer, and unless we look at the customer and then start, um, you know, adjusting ourselves to meet the customer needs, um, I think then of course automatically um, the ROI, in fact, doesn't come there. There basically it comes the cost of ownership. But in the cost of ownership you are delivering, uh, but in the lifetime cost of your product. I think that is that is becoming much much more important, and if you are able to uh, you know uh, take care of the lifetime cost, and if you are then of course even though the initial investments may be more, uh, it doesn't matter if initial investments are more. Everything is funded, so you can you know just convert it into uh, your EMI or then calculate the cost. <coughs> 
So cost of ownership is becoming much, much more important. Absolutely, and, and I'll circle back on that point about the business model. Like you rightly said, you know, it's not about allocating capital. There are various ways you can do pay as you go, pay as you use, so all those models. But let me now move to uh, Shailesh. Of course, uh, you touched upon in your opening remarks, you talked about Atmanirbhar Bharat being self-reliant and how we can be part of the global manufacturing supply chain. Um, how do you see auto companies leveraging I 4.0 in the Indian context to become Atmanirbhar? You know, as uh, let, let me split it into two parts. One that uh, they have to s really sort out at an individual level. And there's a part which they have to do it through more collectively, I would say. And what I do I mean by saying that is that first, you know, uh, individual companies have to create a transformation roadmap strategy uh, and how they are going to therefore go for the execution phase. That part has to be clear and they have to clearly identify areas, you know, where they want to create impact. It has to be very well tied up with the business objectives, right? So once that mapping is done, then there is going to be conviction of the leadership. There is where you are going to put resources and then the series of actions start. The second action then you have to take is about uh, creating the technology infrastructure, creating the enablements to uh, exploit the technology. What I mean by say, for example, the storage infrastructure you talk about or the big data management analytics, uh, cloud-based analytics, all these things you need to really start exploiting the data that is coming to you. Otherwise, uh, it'll be absolutely of waste. Third part is, you know, how you're going to really uh, create the skill sets, how you address the people side. One people side is uh, how you're going to overcome the fear that people have in moving from a certain set of technologies they were they were exposed to and now there's a new technology. So making them familiar, in one panel discussion earlier, you know, the example was given of creating labs where you first familiarize the workforce uh, with uh, the technologies, then all of a sudden you have already covered 50% of the concerns that people have. And then you have to do it on the job. And once you start executing the pilot, there is where uh, reskilling start, upskilling starts. And as you rightly said, you'll have to go for hiring because there are new skill sets required uh, in this area, data scientists, analytics uh, people, all these new skill set will have to be recruited. Also, you know, there will be certain areas where it will be not worth investing into people and outsourcing. So there are make versus buy decisions also that uh, people will have to take here. So I think this is how the industry will have to start preparing towards it. The processes will have an impact. Your delegation of authorities will have an impact because decision making might be transferring from humans to machines. And uh, it was also discussed in that let that be assimilated first, right? That there are certain decisions which is now going to machines. So how the impact will be on the standard operating procedures, SOPs and all, all those things will have to be done by individual companies at individual level. Collectively, I'm saying there are common issues which across the companies uh, people are going to face. Uh, you would need uh, more handholding with the help of academia and all. And those are the initiatives like Samarth and all which have been started. I think we need to fully leverage on that. I think if this is how the industry approaches collectively as well as sorting out your thinking individually is the right uh, part towards exploiting the industry 4.0 and becoming Atmanirbhar as you asked. Absolutely. I think great points about self-development and collaboration and leveraging the entire ecosystem. But I, in my second round, I'd like to come back and pick uh, some specific use cases or deployments that you may have done in your environment. I think let's bring this to life by giving some examples. But let me now move to Eric. Um, Eric, I believe in uh, Bajaj Auto, you have been uh, doing Industry 4.0, digital manufacturing for several years now. And uh, I've heard about, uh, you know, how you work towards making your lines very flexible so that you can respond to market conditions very rapidly. Does this really help you build competitiveness? That's my first question to you. Uh, so the short answer is yes. Uh, we've been making investments uh, for a couple of years now, going back around five years, uh, into uh, making everything we do compatible with uh, IIoT protocols and industry 4.0. 
So uh, we have invested in platforms uh, such as uh, ThingsWorks, and which is a PTC platform for uh, um, you know for, for handling the broker function or the namespace function uh, in the uh, Industry 4.0 stack. So uh, we've made those investments. I think for us, uh, really, the experience has been that uh, you know it does make you more competitive. You know, it's a simple thing of response function to a demand, uh, but there are significant constraints. Look, uh, as an OEM, uh, as you know, we do very little inside. You are heavily dependent on a vendor base, so unless your vendors move in a similar manner, you lose the advantage and edge that these investments give you. So as a first step, what we've done, we've actually bought around, if I remember the number correctly, at least 10 closely tied vendors onto our platform. So in a sense, yes, they're using our platform to implement uh, uh, Industry 4.0 in those vendors. Uh, so there are specific plants which are tied. And as you can imagine, that has been a very tough journey. So there's one internal journey within a company. Uh, and even that journey, I'm not saying is perfect, but the journey across companies is, I think, a far more difficult journey because there are organizational boundaries, there are privacy concerns. You know, why should that company want uh, me as a customer to know the state of his machinery and his lines, which is what effectively you can see in a uh, Industry 4.0 uh, um, uh, setup. So there are issues, and it's not been easy. But the net result has been that, uh, yes, you have much better schedule adherence, if I can use that term. Uh, yes, it's much easier to run changes in schedules, more responsive, but it's been a very, very tough walk to kind of get it done up till then. And uh, I can also say it's not been cheap, you know, but somebody has to make the investment, is my point. Absolutely. And, you know, let me dig a little bit deeper, a follow-up question for you on the whole investment case and how do you really make those judgment calls? Because at the same time, one needs to balance. While, yeah, it's customer-driven and ROI should come secondary, but there are also lots of nice-to-have glamorous uh, technologies that are out there which may not give you the right kind of returns. So how do you balance these two and within Bajaj or what's been your experience? What's the right way to look at these investments and say, yeah, this will help me become more competitive or this will help me save costs? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, there's no simple answer, but if I can, you know, kind of just break it up in a tech stack, if I may. So you have the plant, and plants normally comprise of, uh, uh, I leave the equipment out, that's the physical equipment, but you will have a, a PLC or HMI interface, okay? You, on sitting on top of that, you have a SCADA. Sitting on top of that, you have a, a, a manufacturing execution system, and you have an ERP. And then you have cloud with big data, or, or whatever you call it, smart data. Uh, I think at this step, uh, what we've done is a first stage, because we said this is a foundational block. Let us just get our SCADA and uh, PLI HMI connected up on an IIoT platform. Let us make sure that that data, because if you look at it very clinically, an organization has two data truths. One is what is coming out from the organization, what are the states of the machine and material transformation in a physical uh, product, and what is the state of customer demand. Now, customer demand, we've also made big investments in D2C. Yeah, so, uh, so we are doing those two foundational investments at this point in time. We've, so we are not a true industry 4.0 in that sense. We are not fully connected in the stack, but we've made the two edge investments, if I may use the term, up and down, and we still do a lot of paper in between. We still do a lot of expediting in between, but by connecting this, we've already started seeing some advantage. But I think without doing this connection, you cannot do anything. So the, the idea was, let us do this, let us see where we get, and then we'll figure out where to go next. Absolutely, so do certain no regrets investments which are building blocks that should feed into a overall digital roadmap as you may. So let me come back later in the third round and ask you about how did you go about building this big picture. But uh, at this stage, uh, Shailish, um, you know, being globally competitive, you know, India is going to be among the top five manufacturing, automotive manufacturing locations as well. But finally, this is about delivering enhanced customer experience. In your own ex experience, how do you see that uh, getting linked to Industry 4.0? 
the needs of the customer, giving great customer experience. You know, just one of the use cases is when I book a vehicle, in how many days am I going to get it? And maybe it's getting made when I'm making that order, or how do you uh, work backwards through the entire chain, going back to the orders that are placed on your suppliers? No, that's a great question. I think, you know, as everything has to be centered around customer, and if you're not able to deliver a better experience, possibly the investment is not worth it. And since you're talking about customer experience, we need to really understand how you're going to influence the entire journey you know, of customer from the time a customer starts thinking of purchasing a car, in our case, to the time a customer is thinking of disposing it off or exchanging it for a new. So pretty much cradle to cradle, how you're going to, at each touch point, deliver an experience which brings transparency, which brings convenience, which brings responsiveness. I think this is how we have to think. And uh, you gave example, like, uh, and you can actually create the, use the digital technologies to really deliver a comprehensive, transformative experience through digital means for each touch point. I think that is going to really, the people who are going to do this are going to create a big source of competitive advantage for themselves. And some examples, let me just you know elaborate a bit on my point. Let's take, for example, you said that if uh, uh, you're wanting to buy a car, today you would like to personalize it. It was really not possible you know, in the earlier times to be very respons responsive to that kind of a requirement because the information will flow slowly into the system, then there will be planning, and it will take possibly months. So you put an order for personalized uh, product, and then it will take months for you to get and expect a delivery. Today, with uh, you know the digital supply, you know uh, networks, you can with where information is flowing real time, fast. You can do it much faster. Your manufacturing systems are flexible to take that kind of a personalization requirement. You design your product, which are more modular, to help you do that. So mass personalization is becoming possible with Industry 4.0. Example of what you said: you book a car, you want transparency whether I'm being skipped or somebody else is skipping the queue and getting it, and especially it happened in the last two years, I must say. Uh, many often this used to happen that uh, whether you're, that transparency you're able to give because of uh, this. Talk about uh, what happens to your car post you have purchased, right? What customer experience you're going to give to that, and that is really getting transformed through the use of telematics and connected car, where you are monitoring uh, a car on a live basis, and you are able to therefore deliver prognostics and all, and before the failure of the car, you are able to uh, hint to the customer that uh, your health of the car has issues here. Um, you are also able to add new features, and over the year, you are able to upgrade that. So I think these are the ways how you are going to really uh, bring transparency, convenience, and even after you have sold the car, you have continuous engagement with the customer for something which is beneficial to the customer. So I think, therefore, digital technologies and Industry 4.0 in combination is bringing a opportunity to really influence customer experience in a manner that it can become a big competitive advantage for organizations who move fast on this. Excellent examples there, Shailesh. Let me now move to Mr. Agarwal. Uh, you did touch upon some of the technologies that are you know, really driving i4.0 among auto OEMs. And uh, how do you especially, I mean, maybe you can elaborate a little bit on these technologies, and how do you see this changing manufacturing uh, going forward in the future? Uh, I think, uh, uh, as I mentioned, the customers are becoming very, very demanding. Now, on top of it, if you look at the environment, uh, environment is also very dynamic, for example, you have seen so many uh, situations. When you take the example of COVID, when the COVID happened, suddenly the, uh, the entire sales dropped. And uh, then you had to adjust to your production lines uh, to just producing a few trucks or uh, not producing anything in the initial months. Uh, now, how do you adjust to that sort of a uh, flexibility that is required from you, that you have to keep the morale of your people high? And at the same time, you have to adjust yourself to the changing needs of the customer as well as the uncertainty in the environment. Therefore, your manufacturing has to be, uh, entire system has to be smart. 
uh, that you are able to take these shocks very, very maturely, and you are not, uh, you don't allow these things to impact uh, uh, the, uh, the situation in the uh, factories or in the manufacturing setup. Now, that is possible only if your systems and processes are robust. Because your immediate uh, uh, impact also comes on your suppliers as well as on your dealers. Like for example, when the COVID happened, the, the employer, entire chain was impacted, uh, right from the dealers to the, our own factories and then the suppliers. Uh, now, how do you manage that situation? Uh, so that is where I think uh, one has to then take a very long-term view of the uh, things and uh, and then uh, if required, you have to maybe give the some assistance or some, like those are the things then you have to get into that, that how do you uh, take care of your stakeholders? So that is at the real uh, business level. But as far as the uh, technology is concerned, uh, I think uh, you have to make the best use of your technology to keep your supply chains efficient, to keep your entire system. Like today, uh, you have to produce uh, different variants. Like there are huge number of variants and there are customizations also are happening now. Now, how do you uh, take different models at the same time on the same line? You have to build up that capability. Um, now, how do you ensure that you fit the right wiring harness? How do you ensure that you put the right torque levels uh, on the uh, on the all the nuts? Um, I think those are the things which are very very important. Now today's technology, or when you say smart manufacturing, that allows us to build in these capabilities in our line. We have built in a lot of inter-process verification, or or you have you are able to interlock the you know processes so that the things don't move to the next process if there is any uh, uh, defect uh, which is there in the previous process. Or if you have uh, fit in the right uh, wrong part, uh, the next uh, station will not take that uh, you know, vehicle uh, for the fitting the next item. Because it will just catch there itself. Because you have done the entire thing through the barcoding, you can, you can really see that have you put in the right part or not? Have you put in the, uh, given the right torque? If you suppose you give the wrong torque, you give, uh, first of all, it is not possible because in your nut runners, uh, for each vehicle model, for each variant, the different torque levels are already fed into the system. The moment through the barcode, it senses that this is the model, this is the thing, it automatically sets in that torque level. But if anything goes wrong, then it is, they are able to catch it. So that is how I think through the, uh, through the smart processes, you are able to uh, manage your quality systems. And then, of course, there is real-time feedback. It's not that early, in the earlier systems, if something goes wrong, then you come to know it after a uh, few days that so-and-so process produced a bad quality. Now it is real-time. Like if something is going wrong, it is immediately fed there, and uh, the information automatically flows instantly to the, to the same station, and automatically uh, the the person has to correct himself. So there are a lot of, like the automatic, lot of internal controls in the system now with the smart manufacturing process. Oh, absolutely, I think industry 4.0, one of the things like you were mentioning is gonna break the silos and get, you know, all the functional areas connected and eventually connected back to the customer on one end and the supplier on another end. But one thing, Shailesh, um, you know, in the past, supply chains were designed to be efficient. You know, I have lots of friends who are in pro purchase and procurement function, and they, they talk about how for them the main thing was how can I reduce cost year on year. But we saw, especially in the last two, three years, it, you know, you design supply chains for continuity uh, to deal with volatility, you know. How do you think Industry 4.0 and getting your suppliers to be part of this journey, you know, uh, how does it help to make your supply chains more uh, resilient at that? And uh, how should large companies and their suppliers digitize together? What's your view on this? You know, um, I personally feel that uh, there'll always be a bit of lag between when the OEMs do and when the suppliers do. Um, there might be exceptions, and I'll talk about that exception. But uh, generally speaking, 
OEMs will go first with their industry 4.0 strategy. And then you also start you know, connecting with what you need, therefore in the entire supply chain, because that is ultimately the full exploitation of industry 4.0. And the same set of issues, challenges that you had in your mind, you are sorted out in your thinking and therefore that can be completely transferred from a mindset perspective. This is what you also start to do. So mindset change also comes by you having done that and therefore having the credibility of then convincing mm. uh, the supplier. So I think that's the first stage. And uh, then in the process, you have gone through developing of skill set, uh, developing certain infrastructure, uh, certain technologies, you know, and, and the knowledge, et cetera. This is all that you need to therefore handhold and transfer that to them. So technology transfer, if that is needed, how to go about development of people, reskilling, upskilling, how you're going to handhold them and support them. And it's not, not new. We have been doing, whenever we have created a system, we have taken it forward to the suppliers through very focused teams which work in a dedicated manner to work with the suppliers on them. I think this is how we'll have to do that. And of course, then, you know, initiatives like Samarth and all is fast forwarding that uh, whole journey to a great 